Time. It's for public comment. Anything not on our agenda tonight? I do not have any cards. But does anyone wish to speak? Okay. And we have no presentations tonight. Um, uh, I'm presenting the agenda as listed. Does um, anyone have any adjustments? Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. I'm sorry. Approval of the agenda first. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what I asked him for. Yes. <laughs> I didn't realize. And then he said consent. That's right. Oh, sorry, Cal. I missed that. Of the agenda. Okay. And I have a second for that. I'll second that one too. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Now we're moving to the consent agenda. Like, like motion with the consent agenda. Okay. Do I have a second? A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Um, so we go to, we have no action items, public hearings resolution. Resolution number 2019-191, acceptance of awarded land and water conservation fund grant for Collilock Park renovation and then the associated, associated budget amendment. Um, Ms. Devin. Resolution number 2019-191, a resolution of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, related to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection grant for the Collilock Park Project and related budget adjustment, providing for authorization to accept grant and execute grant documents, providing for approval of the 2019-20 budget adjustment, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for Scrivener's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I'd like to ask Amy Jewell, our Leisure Services Director, to come up and just give you a summary of what this um, wonderful uh, grant and award um, really includes, and then a little bit of information on the budget amendment. I see Tom um, Klinker is also in the audience if you happen to have any questions from him from a financial perspective. Good evening. This is a request for City Council to um, accept the award from the Land Water Conservation Fund to renovate Collilot Park. Um, as most of you know, Collilot Park is a two-acre park in the middle of the Northeast community. It hosts the African American Festival, the Juneteenth Festival, as well as the um, Art in the Park. Um, it has amenities such as the basketball court, uh, the pavilions, the grills, amphitheater, uh, playground equipment, um, several things that need to be renovated. This, is, this award does include, um, it requires a matching fund, so that's why we're asking for a budget amendment. The staff has identified $200,000 in discretionary park projects that were allocated for the seawall. Um, we have um, actually Public Works has met with and projects have met, met um, over the, the seawall, and it has been decided that can wait a year, um, preferably, so we can do the... Um, uh, Grantham Point Seawall and potentially the Evans Park Seawall at the same time. So um, the, these renovations are necessary. They were identified in the Parks and Rec Master Plan. We do have several safety concerns, um, specifically with the, the grills and um, the, the fire hazards as well as the children's um, playground equipment. So it is very important that this gets done um, sooner rather than later. Um, I'd also like to thank the Community Trust. They did write a letter of support for this grant and for the um, park and um, that, that always helps to secure these funds. We're excited. This is the maximum amount allowed through the Land Water Conservation Grant and we have three years to um, utilize these, these grant funds. Do you have any questions? So I'd just like to uh, make a note that um, if some of you recall in our budget process this past year, um, we actually approved some funding in the discretionary, uh, discretionary fund as Amy addressed. We also addressed money from the CRA to fund this. Those monies in the CRA have not been touched yet. We've come back at mid-year, um, present to you that reduction and put money back to the fund balance um, until you decide what to do with the seawall in the future. But the, um, the engineering assessment does need to take place and we would present to you a package for that going forward. 
with the uh, seawall remaining in the budget, it puts us in a very good position for another grant, which Amy and her crew will be looking uh, to in the future from possibly water agencies of different types, um, even the state, FDEP, and some of those, again, because it has to do with water in a, in a seawall. It's very different than our land grant, so to speak. So, thank you. Um, not a question, but thank you all for... I mean, $200,000 grant, that's fantastic. We, get, we match that, but we get double for our money, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. So, Mr. Massey? I also echo that. My thanks to the staff. It's nice to have a current uh, Parks and Recreation Master Plan on the shelf at a time when we need it, and uh, thanks to the Parks and Recreation folks who uh, punched the uh, grant writing process. Uh, we get to do a $400,000 renovation for $200,000, which is just terrific. Thank you all. It's nice when a plan comes together. And the operative word, Mr. Massey, an approved comprehensive plan on the shelf. Remember, that was our issue before. Okay, Mr. Rawson. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be a, a feel-good statement that everybody's making, but grants are great. $200,000, thank you. Thank you to all those that put the grant together. And more importantly than that is there was a reflection of the absolute need in Collie Park, Collie Lot Park. I mean, it is a, a dear need. Uh, some of that equipment is not healthy. <laughs> I don't want to say the D word, but it's not. it needs to be fixed. And uh, all that other re renovation is going to be there is really good. And I suspect that... We might even need more, but because it's it, there's such a need there, but I certainly uh, support this, and it's uh, thanks to those that got the free money, quote unquote, uh, for doing this. So thank you all. I vote yes. Any, anyone else? Does anyone from the public wish to speak on this item? Where is this part? <coughs> It's actually on um, Highland Street and Pine Avenue, in the middle of the Northeast community. There's two parks. There's, there's, a, there's a park two parks side by park side, side out there. Yeah. Yeah. North, and, north and south of each other. And it definitely is in dire need of some um, work on it. It's been on the list for a while. And the, and the, um, the good thing starting out is it is very much used by the community when there are events to be had. We were just out there a couple weeks ago, and um, it does have some areas that we need to address when you have a lot of youngins running around. And they do like to run around and play. Anyone else? Okay, back to council. I'll entertain a motion. I so move. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call, please. <coughs> Mr. Rolfson? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Crail? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Mayor Hope? Yes. Thank you. Resolution 2019-178, provision of utility tree trimming services. Ms. Stippen. Resolution number 2019-178, a resolution the City of Maldora, Florida, pertaining to tree trimming services for electrical lines, providing le for legislative findings and intent, providing for approval of agreement and authorization to execute, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for Scrivener's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Ms. Hayes. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor, Council Member. Wayne Zimmerman, he is our Deputy uh, Director for Electrical Services, will give you a, a little bit of a summary of this particular project and contract. Good evening, Council. Let me take this opportunity to present an overview of the scope of services that are incorporated into this contract and part of our vegetation management plan. Safety, best practices, and the National Electric Code safety clearances enable our department to measure the performance of the contractor performing these services for the city of, of Mount Dora and safe and reliable service to our citizens. This management plan has uh, enable us to be fully compliant to the full Public Service Commission since 2006, reporting handling annually in the storm hardening statutes. Now, historically, we've used a contractor to provide these services with an agreement that incorporates both equipment 
labor, and fuel into an hourly rate. The existing tree trimming contract expired on September 29th of 2019, and the city opted not to renew in order to seek competitive pricing. Since then, we've been on a month-to-month -month arrangement until the bid process was complete. On November 4th, we issued invitation to bid with three suppliers submitting proposals. These bids were evaluated based upon pricing, specification compliance, qualified supplier, and reference information. The lowest responsible and responsive bid was submitted by the Davy Tree Expert Company. Questions? Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from the audience have any questions regarding this item? Seeing none, back to council. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and second. Discussion. Um, I uh, am from Kent, Ohio, um, and the Davy Tree Expert um, <coughs> World Headquarters was about 200 feet from uh, one of the schools in my school district there. I just want to... Um, uh, say that I do a little bit of work for Davy Tree. Uh, it's an employee-owned company, um, and I read, help read their scholarship applications on an annual basis. I'm, I'm not a major stockholder, or they don't have any buildings named after me or anything, but I, I always say if that comes up that I do a little bit of work for Davy I Tree. Nice no for that. Thank you for disclosing. Any other discussion? John. got one up several times during the past year uh, with their contractors. Or, and you can't control everybody. I fully understand that. But okay. On. Okay, as I said, several times during the past year, a couple people were brought to my attention uh, about some of their employees. And uh, just when they're on site and when they get there, maybe they should work, uh, as opposed to uh, some of the length of time they spent on projects uh, outside my house with one where the guy was doing everything but playing air guitar. Uh, he was quite comfortable in his truck there. But it just, if we can talk to the management pe people there about just kind of monitoring them so when they get there, they're ready to work. More than, one, more than one person has brought it to my attention. Plus, I've seen it myself. So I'm glad they got the contract, but just uh, maybe light a fire uh, under them once they get there. As we, we've had this discussion before, <clears throat> I have some very alert ladies that live in the condo building that I live, and they watched a gentleman for four hours sleep in his <laughs> truck. So yes, Mr. Ra Ra um, Charles, when he was still here, he had conversation with them. And just to make you aware, too, if you didn't hear, sometimes they kind of get off track and if someone's not managing them, but trust me, there'll be somebody that will call one of us and let us know and we'll call you and say, you might want to check on the corner of so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, to Mr. Con Tucker's concern, uh, Davy Tree did make some changes after we approached them with those problems. Uh, here's what it came down to is that Davy Tree had a corporate structure where they grouped municipalities and independent operator companies together. We were grouped with JEA, Jacksonville Electric, and Kissimmee Utility Authority in Mount Dora. We were all municipalities with one supervisor that ran between Jacksonville, Mount Dora, and Kissimmee, which created some logistic problems. Davy listened to our concerns, our extreme concerns. They changed that corporate structure so that now we are part of Duke Energy, which is an adjoining supervisor to our service territory, so they get we get more direct supervision and also contingency resources as we move. Good. Thank you. There's also another piece that we'll be adding as soon as this does go into place mm -hmm. is we're going to utilize the GIS tool that Mr. Laval put in place to utilize that to track those scheduling throughout the course of the year to make sure we're making progress on these activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yes, Mr. Olson. Oh, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, roll call, please. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Ms. Burgett? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Crail? Yes. Ms. 
Hope. Yes. Okay, resolution 2019-184, piggyback agreement for RCM utilities with Zephyr Hills. Ms. Stephan. Resolution number 2019-184, resolution of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to water, waste, and wastewater, miscellaneous construction and maintenance services, providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for approval, piggyback agreement, and authorization to execute, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for scrivener's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Um, Joe Krasakis will come up and address. This is a, a SCADA system for our water and wastewater plants. And Joe, um, staff is in the other room, so we have to give them just a moment to come in here. Yes. Come on up, Joe, please. Um, just a summary, please, of the piggyback agreement uh, for RCM utilities in Zephyr Hills. Yes, ma'am. Um, RCM is a very small, small contractor. They do projects like thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars. They're very responsive. They've done several projects for us in the past. They've been very responsive, and that's the problems we have is trying to get the big boys to show up. So RCM would be a great contractor to supplement our staff on small projects. Um, Joe, can you? I've had a couple questions, so I'd like to clarify if we can. Maybe it'll help. Council, um, talk a little bit about the dollar amount that we're contracting with them for, um, and then going forward, it's a three-year contract, if I recall. Yes, and, and this is just more routine, small stuff that shows up. We have a, a like a um, a pump that's very difficult to replace. They have specialized tools. They'll come in and do the job. They usually come in after hours. Um, they get it done without interrupting our services, and they're probably fifteen to. Thirty thousand dollar jobs, and it's R and R. It's kind of planned in, in the in the budget, but we don't fix it unless it's breaking. So, so thank you. Um, maybe now that you say it's such a small company, maybe this answers my question. But usually in our agreements, there's something about using subcontractors, and there's not in this. Agreement. They don't use subcontractors. Okay. They, they, it's a very small company. Gotcha. This is also a piggyback agreement. So largely when we do a piggyback, we take the terms of the agreement the way they were negotiated. There are certain things that we do negotiate that are specific to the city of Mount Dora and we let them know you're going to make sure that the indemnification addresses us, that the insurance addresses us, that the required public records law addresses us, but we can't really deviate too much from what's been negotiated otherwise um, because then it's not a true piggyback. And that would include venue, would it not? Make sure that it's venue Absolutely. is Lake County. Thank you. Any other questions from Council? Anyone in the audience wish to ask or address this issue? Back to Council. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Crayle? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Stile? Yes. Mr. Rolfson? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mayor Hopes? Yes. Okay. See, we have no action items, no public hearings, resolutions. Ordinances. First reading of ordinance number 2019-21, annexation of Bristol Lake Space 2 LSC. Ms. Stuffin. Ordinance number 2019-20, an ordinance of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to the final development plan. Oh. Ordinance number 2019-21, an ordinance of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to the voluntary annexation of property, property generally <coughs> located at the northwest corner of U.S. Highway 441 and Bristol Lakes Road, providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for voluntary annexation, providing for effective annexation, providing an amendment to Chapter 2 Code of Ordinances, providing for filing requirements, providing for implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for limited codification and Scribner's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. 
Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. So Vince Sandersfeld will come up and just give you an idea of the, again, this is an annexation, so that's all we're addressing here this evening, but he'll go over the rules and regulations um, and any meetings that have uh, preceded this meeting. Uh, the petition in front of you is a voluntary annexation uh, 1.61 acres. Uh, it's located next to the Bristol Lake Apartments on 441. Uh, it's a continuation of the Phase 2 project. Uh, they need to expand their ingress, egress to the project and purchase part of the property from the Simpsons family, the Orange Grove. And they're going to incorporate the ingress, egress. So that's why it's a little small chunk, because it'll be incorporated to the property to the <coughs> south uh, eventually. Uh, you'll be seeing those project plans later if and so they proceed. Uh, the annexation meets our requirements and meets the requirements of Florida statutes. Uh, goes through two readings. Uh, we take this to this uh, city council for the first reading consideration. Uh, it's in our joint planning area agreement. Obviously, it's a fill uh, of the enclave, so it's it's appropriate annexation, and we recommend approval of the ordinance to proceed to the second hearing. So, Vince, can you get? Sorry, Vince, can you just uh, briefly? You have a map included. Can you just briefly address the map, just so that um, everyone uh, from council as well as the audience? understands the property even though you've specified the, sure, the yeah. uh, acreage page 440 as I have it. so the subject property again is just shy of two acres uh, the Bristol Lakes Road is to the east of it and uh, US Highway 441 to the north uh, this encompasses the the Orange Grove as you're traveling along west of Donnelly and then through town you'll see the Orange Grove and then the Bristol Lake Apartments uh, to the south of it, it doesn't touch. It's probably um, uh, 500 feet north of Limit Avenue. It's to the south. So it's sandwiched between Limit 441 and, and west of Bristol Lake Roads, uh, the existing apartments. Uh, it's a little tiny chunk, so it really isn't meaningful to describe because it will be used as part of an access road again. For the uh, audience, it is the black sliver in the uh, spray screen that I'm showing, a very small area. Plot configuration, yeah. So the white part of the map that you have here is really not any part of that inclusion. Correct. Okay. Oh, and then there's a survey included with the description. Oh, yeah. okay. So, so we had a few uh, challenges. Uh, yes, technical challenges. I looked at that earlier. As I meet with council members, the maps yes, look different when they would bring up their iPads, and that was the reason I asked that you do this, so that we could see why we had a problem. So thank you. Not a problem. <laughs> And next time, what we want to do is be able to put it up so people can see it. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. So um, this is a public hearing. So does anyone from the public <coughs> wish to speak on this? Back to council for discussion. Any further discussion? I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Um, roll call, please. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mr. Rothson? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Crail? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mayor Hope? Yes. Okay, next item. Final reading of ordinance number 2019-20. P uh, final PUD cottages on 11th. Ms. Now. Well, now you can go that one. <laughs> <coughs> of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to the final development plan for the cottages on 11th, providing for the legislative findings and intent, providing for the rezoning and approval of the cottages on 11th planned unit development terms and conditions, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for non-codification and scrivener's errors, providing for complex, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Um, again, I'd like to ask uh, Vince Sandersfeld, the Planning Director, um, to come up and just a, a brief summary of the cottages and what's before you this evening as a final. Petition in front of you is a final reading of the Ordinance 2019-20 of the final plan unit development, final PUD for the cottages on 11th. Uh, the property is located on 11th Avenue between 0441 and west of Helen. Uh, this property has gone through very various uh, public hearings through a preliminary PUD, and it was approved by this board in September. 
And then we had the first reading, uh, first year of Christmas time, December 5th, we had the first reading. At that time, there was quite a bit of discussion from the public and input and, and interest in this project. Uh, the Planning Commission, which we reviewed it in November, had some conditions as well. Uh, the City Council at the last meeting recommended approval of the final PUD with the four conditions to add to the master plan. They wanted to replace the sidewalks on 11th per code, use a type F, which is a raised curbing along in landscape areas for protection, so there's no encroachment into landscape areas that will achieve that. And no on-site burning of any vegetation. It's an orange grove, so they will need to remove those so they're not allowed to burn them on site. They'll have to use other methods. And then the landscape plan would be required at the preliminary plat preliminary engineering, if you will, stage, which is a little advanced. So the Planning Commission can review uh, the heavy buffering and so forth and those changes up front. Normally the landscape plan is done at the final construction plan, but that will be a condition of the plan. Uh, staff did note on our staff report, we did add a little more clarification on one item about the bonding issue. We did summarize, I won't read the code, but we have bonding performance bond protections of infrastructure during the planning stage of all developments. That's per our land development code regulations, and I know folks are interested in the protection of the development and so forth. Then uh, I did receive a few e emails on impact fees. Um, they're they're required. Uh, all, all the homes. There's no waivers. Uh, they must meet our requirements. Um, not knowing the size of the home, I'm just going on their basic. You know, they have an 18,000 square foot home. You're probably looking at a $22,000 impact fee. But that's a no thrills home. They didn't project that, so you could. We're seeing homes come in twenty-six thousand dollar impact fees. That's a, something we typically see. Twenty-five, twenty-six. About not quite half that goes to the schools, and there is a transportation for Lake County. So there's about a nine thousand impact that transferred. We collect it and then we distribute it back to Lake County for the school impacts and road impacts and the rest of it is our water sewer reclaim parks library police and fire impact fees are all calculated now again some of those will fluctuate on the water and sewer depending on the number of um, luxury high-end fixtures and things that they go the, the particular quote i gave you 22 thousand is a you know everybody's crammed into one bedroom and i don't think that's what we're going to be seeing so uh, so their impact fees will be one can anticipate higher. So with that, that's quick summary. Um, there was no further changes to the ordinance. We did add Exhibit D to the ordinance, which are those four conditions from the previous. So that's ratified in the ordinance, which we'll take care of those conditions. The developer for this particular uh, approval, that authorized the zoning. They have to follow all the mandates in the master plan and all the conditions of the master plan. And they have an Exhibit C, which is their design guidelines which they have to follow those as well. So as development proceeds to the next step, which is engineering drawing, if so approved, then they would imply all these standards that to be consistent. If not, then we'll, we'll have to have discussions, but they have to be consistent with the PUD. And that sets that zoning district. Staff recommends approval of the second reading of the ordinance as it follows through with your first conditions. Thank you, Betsy. Anything else, Ms. Hayes? Um, I would say that it was 1,800 square foot um, versus 18,000 as a bit oh. <laughs> into the thousand um, conversation. Um, we have uh, detailed information on the impact fees. We've had no other questions presented to us to consider or to bring back to you. Um, and I would defer to our legal team, but um, I know that anytime you take into consideration a, a build a from a developer, there are certain um, things that we have to take into consideration and which we would not be able to present to you to deny because legally they would be entitled to that. And I don't know if our, our legal uh, attorney has any comments to make in reference to that. Correct statement. Do you have any, any further? Clint like to speak. Tom Lightsey, Florida Realty and Development, 2105 Park Avenue, North Winter Park, Florida. We appreciate the council's approval on December the 3rd, not the 5th, um, another small technicality, and support for this project. I'd like to answer any new questions that have come up. Uh, I know the project's been uh, discussed quite in length, so 
I'm here to answer any questions that new questions that you may have. Anyone on council have questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, one more. Miss Styles does. Um, between our last meeting and this evening, I, I had some further conversation with Dennis um, regarding the setbacks of the homes on 11th, and um, it's unclear to me and. Through, even still unclear through Dennis's answer that are are the setbacks what is the setback from the homes on 11th so if I'm standing on the sidewalk how far will I be to a home according to I, I think according to Dennis's answer the way I understand it is it's up to the architectural review committee but I feel like that's something I need a number tonight okay well uh, let me say a couple things and I'm gonna have Ted add to it because we're going to be replacing the sidewalk so where the sidewalk exists today in relationship to the property, property boundary, I'm not sure. Um, but from the front lot line, as the PUD is, is written, the minimum setback, and keep that in mind, that's a minimum setback, is 20 feet. Now one of the reasons why we have the setbacks set this way is we intend to, with that flexibility, be able to stagger some of the homes to give it a little bit more interest and, and curb appeal. Um, so to answer your question, Ted, it's 20 feet from the existing curb today. I mean, from the existing sidewalk. Okay. But please keep in mind, that's the minimum. And our architectural review committee will review each of those homes so that we get it the, the way that it needs to be for the best look. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go to public hearing. Does anybody in the public wish to speak? I am not going to have the clock run. I'm going to hopefully, you know, we'd like to stay within three minutes. If someone goes beyond it significantly, then I will ask you to summarize. Um, but that clock run sometimes is a deterrent to me, so I'd rather listen to what you're saying rather than watch a clock. But I would ask you to respect the fact that we're talking, and I would not... Everyone is um, able to say what you want to say, but if we're repeating everything, the same thing over and over, then that's not a benefit to anyone. Um, so have salient points for us. Uh, we'd appreciate it. So with that, if someone would like, please state your name and your address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Charlie Sands. I live at 980 Page Lane in Mount Dora. I know you're tired of listening to this, but I'd like to just a little bit. Okay. For once in your council terms, please put on your uh, better sides and understand that to us, it's really a wrong thing to do in our neighborhood. It's wrong, not just for that, but it's all for the Pinecrest, the entire Pinecrest neighborhood. It's wrong for the city of Mount Dora because it sets a horrible precedent to have a PUD set in the middle of a suburban area, okay? Um, apparently, from the huge crowds you had, um, a lot of people are against this development as it stands. Not that we're against a development, but we're just the way it is. And I don't understand why you're going and approving it anyway, as it is. Um, is it because of the tax base that you could really get uh, a lot of money to, to uh, make the downtown vibrant again? Well, I'm sure that all of us would like that to be have a vibrant downtown, but as long as that vibrancy doesn't come into the neighborhoods <laughs> and <coughs> disturbs the peaceful, uh, uncluttered way that we live in, how much more of an encroachment can we have than to have six two-story cottages aimed too close to our entire garden subdivision and right into our bedroom windows? Couldn't you just require that that buffer be a little bit wider than what we've been given wide enough that a double row of trees be allowed there so that at least that will make it screened enough that we don't have to be constantly reminded that you've encroached on us anyway. Um, whatever your reasons for, for doing what you're doing, please remember that Mount Dora is special not just because of the historic nature and charm, but be also because of the community spirit and that that community spirit can only be maintained with a little give and take from all, all sides. These types of developments would change Mount Dora from the quaint, charming town that we've all come here to love and 
turn it into something that's not quaint, not charming, but instead is full of the clutter and the sameness of typical PUDs. And I'm sure that none of us really want Maldora to become that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Because of where my mother lives, I'm on 11th all the Please time. Please state your name and oh, where yes. you live. My name is Sue Jantz, yes. and I live at 1755 Gertrude Place. Um, I'm on 11th all the time because of where my mother lives. She used to live in Villadora, and now she lives in um, the uh, Waterman Village. Uh, I'm on that road all the time, and I'm very concerned about the safety. Uh, plus, I'm a bicyclist, as my husband and Charlie, um, uh, we see each other often uh, biking around. And I like to think Mount Dora is a pedestrian-friendly and a bike-friendly city. Um, we like to use our bikes to get downtown to support the restaurants and the merchants down there. Um, and I just think something like this, with this much density, is going to uh, diminish people's uh, ability and enthusiasm for getting downtown in something other than a car. And it will also, I think, diminish our safety. I, was, I always knew the property would be developed. It's absolutely beautiful. The natural beauty is terrific. And I could imagine how many people might be interested in developing it. But I never thought I'd see this kind of density. I thought it would be developed in keeping with the other homes in the neighborhood, the property, lot sizes of the other homes in the, in the surrounding part of town. And so I'm disappointed. Uh, I'd just like to ask if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to use a show of hands uh, to keep from having to repeat things but to use a show of hands to uh, express that they're also disappointed by the density. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak? Yes, sir. And then I'll come over. Morning, Redden, 1141 Gardner Street, Rodora, Florida. <coughs> Uh, a couple of things that were touched on at the uh, last meeting that I would like to touch on. We, uh, you talked about the sidewalks in front of the cottages on 11th. The sidewalks on 11th Avenue from Old 441 to Donnelly Street are a disaster. They're four feet wide. Okay. Uh, if since, you, since we're here on for this hearing, I want you to... I need you to speak directly to this particular item. We can talk about that at another component time, but we need to stay focused on this item, and, and the sidewalks beyond that really isn't for discussion right now, okay? So, but... Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, see what I'm saying? This is, we're here well, well, for this hearing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, well, let's start with them. We need a uh, some kind of multi-use trail. I, I brought this up one other time. And I was somebody, uh, uh, a uh, uh, city representative made a comment I wouldn't want to afford the, uh, the insurance. And here's the problem. Regardless of where that sidewalk is, let's talk about just the one in front of the cottages. It is a multi-use trail. We have bicyclists, we have dog walkers. Uh, and the other thing that's going to happen uh, is that we have pedestrians trying to cross. Right now it's dangerous. I will bring it up with the plan, but it, let's start there. Let's put a really nice wide sidewalk where people can really share. Okay? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Rhonda Sale, 955, Coral Lane. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I've been visiting Mount Dora for 20 to 25 years, grew up in West Palm, and thought, what a great place to retire. So I came up here a little over a year and a half ago. The way this place is growing and exploding, why did I live West Palm? 
um, you know, it, it's, it's not going to be quaint, in my opinion. Um, one of the last big um, events that you had downtown, if you could have seen the backup on 11th trying to get in, it was a disaster. And this is what's going to be continued on a regular basis with 27 homes in there. Why not 20? I mean, is, it, is the city being so greedy? I know you want tax money, I understand that. We don't have enough parking downtown. So, the remedy, I don't know, but I'm deeply disappointed. Uh, the two council members that voted against it, thank you. Um, not that it did any good. I want to see that developed, but I think what you're putting on it is a huge mistake. And the last thing, no disrespect to the developer, but when he said, well, it becomes feasible that, you know, we just won't do this, I saw panic in you guys. Oh, let's go ahead and vote. Have you guys been bought? I don't know. But that's my opinion, so thank you. Thank you. Ms. Thatcher? Lynn Tatcher, Country Club. I have a question. When I went to the first hearing on this, you're reading, um, Lori Tillett, who was on council at the time, suggested that she voted in favor it based on it being 22 to 23 homes. She thought 27 was way too many. And I, it was on the record and everything. I, since that time, I have not heard any adjustment to that. My other question, when I looked at the whole thing, too, going down towards 0441, is there going to be some type of a thing so that if there are children living in the neighborhood, and I'm going to presume that with two-story houses, this is not going to be a retiree's neighborhood. Most retirees are going to go to a one-story, I hate to say it. Um, so we've got a budget for the, our schools, because we're going to have children in there, and, and um, more traffic and stuff like that, but also access to the lake. So there would be some kind of thing to prohibit any children living in that neighborhood from getting towards down towards Old 441 and, and the lake and stuff. But I guess I'm wondering if you adjusted the number of houses. No. So that wasn't considered? That, that, that was discussed and the developer heard the discussion, but when they came back they did not adjust it. But it was not a recommendation that was made in a formal way. It was in part of a discussion, if right. I recall. Yeah. Right, yeah. So you're sticking firm with 27? It's what the application has. Okay. Mr. Middleton. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, Council Members, <clears throat> City Manager. My name is Harlow Middleton. I'm an attorney located at 699 East 5th Avenue in Mount Dora. I represent Donna Brown and Ken Mazik. They have property on the southwest portion of the boundary on this property. My clients are not opposed to infill. They're not uh, a, per se against this uh, uh, development. But they have the same concerns as their neighbors and are supportive of their concerns. The project is a good one, but in the opinion of uh, my clients, it would be a better one if it was a 25-foot buffer rather than the 20 feet, and they would respectfully ask for that, but I uh, do want to say they're, they're very respectful of uh, the whole process of this, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Una Fox and I live at 980 Page Lane. My realtor was Dave Lowe Realty's iconic Lucy Hummel. I remember Lucy saying, when you live in Mount Dora, you live on the yellow brick road. I did not question, I knew exactly what she meant. The Simpson family built most of the downtown of Mount Dora. Or according to Bob Simpson, the Simpson Hotel was originally designed by his grandfather to be five stories. His grandfather decided to make it three stories. He set a standard that was influ has influenced buildings' heights to this day. 
the Sadler family settled here in the late 1800s, and at one time they owned more than 300 acres of citrus. A descendant, Sam Sadler, is a well-known local builder. He built his own home in our uh, gardener's subdivision, a beautiful home in keeping with the character of Mount Doro. He is well known for his Dogwood Mountain Reserve, situated just above the old uh, Mount Dora Road. Homes known for their quality of craftsmanship and more are set among gently sloping hills and dense, densely, dense shade trees. Building this, uh, building all with the new was the quest of local builder Alan Cheek with his mossy oaks cottages. Six 1920 uh, Florida cracker uh, flavor homes tucked away on approximately a quarter acre lots near Highland and Clayton. These beautiful cottages are a labor of intensive blend of modern conveniences and authentic antique pieces. Around 2,000 square feet on a comfortable sized lot, once, uh, one, one recently sold for uh, $400,000. Keith Fields, a young contractor who sadly is no longer with us, was well known for his ability to renovate and construct homes in keeping with the, our city. His own beautiful Florida plantation cell home on Lakeshore Drive has inspired other similar homes to be constructed on neighboring lots. The most recent under construction is a traffic stopping <coughs> million dollar marvel of early 20th century architecture. Richard Edgerton is a name that does not seem to be on any street building or park. The, Ed the Edgerton's owned the Lakeside Inn for nearly 50 years. Our, heroic our historic roadhouse row exists because of his ownership of a boat building company. In the 1950s, Richard Edgerton, thanks to a friendship with the governor, was instrumental in the state rerouting Highway 440 run around Mount Dora instead of through it. Many feel he saved the town from destruction. His wife, Marie Egerton, was a co-founder of the Lake and Hills Garden Club, the first accredited flower show judge in Lake County. Most pointedly, her obituary mentions she was uh, sustained by her charitable Christian faith. Marie Egerton left one of the most desirable parcels of land inside our city limits, not to her daughters, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren. She left this nearly 10-acre orange grove overlooking Lake Dora to the Mount Dora Christian Academy. Locals who knew her, say, knew her say she would be horrified by the Christian Academy's decision to allow 27 homes to be built on her gift. Sure, it was uh, in her mind, they are sure it was in her mind the property would be used by the Academy to expand the school. In my opinion, in their desperation to make money, the Christian Academy appears to be willing to turn their backs on our own community. In their haste to make money, the school is being razzle-dazzled by Winter Park carpetbaggers who do not have proper <laughs> understanding of our city or our history. In my opinion, the Edgerton's legacy is being disrespected by the school, and our city is being sold out. I have mentioned a few of the local builders who might find a way to develop the property and raise the money the school seems to need. Builders who understand and respect the community of, and the Ed, Ed Kirkin name. The city will open uh, a Pandora's box if you approve this plug. Yes, our city has been has always been growing. Growth often, uh, growth often protected by many of the names on our buildings, parks, streets, and our community. Do not be razzle-dazzled. This property can make the money the city would like to put in their piggy bank. It just has to be the proper fit for the city, a proper development that will benefit our neighborhoods. It's not too late to step back and revisit this PUD. Make sure you have figured out the best solutions for the city's continued growth and development. What you decide here tonight is going to be titanic. Please make your council's historical legacy the uh, the Mount Dora City Council that decision protected the yellow brick road and not a trip and not rip up the it rip it up brick by brick anyways <laughs> sorry thank you Frank Hi, my name is Frank Ford I live at uh, 847 McDowell Street Mount Dora uh, several months ago, a neighbor uh, of ours uh, sought approval to split his residential lot in the city, not far from the planned development. He was told the frontage had to be 90 feet. 
I, was, I also checked on this because I was a little concerned about all this deal. And uh, I was assured by staff on two occasions that there was no lot in the city that could be approved that did not have 90-foot frontage and required side and rear setbacks as per current code. It is apparent that this is not the case. All you got to do is petition for a change, and, you know, I guess you can get it. Uh, council has the authority to not approve this plan. The majority of residents in this neighborhood have spoken against it. Petitions were signed. Suggestions made and compromise sought, all apparently to no avail. Uh, people in Mount Dora want the city to maintain its singular nature, not be an imitation of Baldwin Park, or Celebration, or Longwood, or Lake Mary, or Winter Park. It's time for council to represent their constituents. As the former council member, Ms. Tillett, said, she is here to represent the people who live here now. Thank you. Josh Hemingway, 1177 East 5th Avenue. I'm actually here to ask a question on behalf of some younger people that are unable to attend council meetings because council meetings aren't designed to accommodate younger people, as we have discussed, which should be discussed in the future. Um, they were made aware by some of their younger friends that uh, Councilman Slavey at one time had brought up trying to turn this piece of property into a park and had lobbied for it. And then they heard nothing. And their question to me was, was this piece of property ever offered up publicly, or did the Christian Home and Bible School go ahead and entertain this privately so that it was acquired? But they want to know why the city never even considered purchasing it, or one of the larger developers in town, including one that happens to live next door to it, didn't entertain purchasing the property for the benefit of the city. And I couldn't answer it because I don't know. So if anybody could answer that, I could inform them. Um, so the city did reach out to them. Um, the dollar amount that was um, decided by the city council to consider offering um, was not the dollar amount that was to be considered by Mount Dora Christian Academy. Um, they were expecting a, a more money. Um, so we uh, went to the point of our high end, um, and at that point in time it was not attainable for the city, um, as well as our financial advisor looked at the cost of the property um, from a perspective of um, it being a park or something to that effect, um, and the return on that from his perspective um, would have been a bit of a challenge for the city. Um, so, uh, but we did try to negotiate with it um, for the property initially up to the point where we, and I don't recall the dollar amount right now, but um, we did reach out and speak with them several different times. Okay, so basically the, the, the property then was offered by Dr. Moore to uh, uh, other the, people, or was it ever publicly for sale? Um, it was up for sale. They did have a real estate agent okay. listing it, um, and the current um, company that's looking to purchase it um, or has purchased it, um, they were not in the picture at that point in time. So, okay. again, he did he did work with us in good faith. Um, we just couldn't come to a dollar amount based on what our expectations were to use that park and the dollar amount that was um, expected to be spent there. Sadly, that's a bit of a shame. It's a bit like Pineapple Point. You know, we should purchase that, too. But Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Wish? Jay. Good evening, everybody. Jay Smith. I live at 1046 McDonald Street on the corner of 11th and McDonald. <clears throat> um, at, last, uh, at the last city council meeting, <clears throat> someone, I don't remember who now, um, asked if there had ever been a traffic study on 11th, or in all of Mount Dora for that matter. And um, Kathy, you asked the question, and I believe the answer was, no, there's never been a traffic study on 11th. Am I correct? So we do. We did have studies. Uh, they've been, um, um, I think, calming, traffic calming. We actually had in the budget for this year. Uh, the current year we're in the full study um, but we had to look at adjusting funding and that was one of the projects that we could adjust back and look at a calming program uh, for a limited area and still try to be able to present the areas of concern for high traffic volume for the areas of Clayton um, 11th 
um, Overlook Hilltop versus the entire city, and we know we'll have to look at the entire city, and that will be forthcoming. But there are traffic studies with each of the development programs that are presented to county, to the council, because they are required as part of your PNZ packet. So there are traffic studies with each development. Some of them do um, require certain adjustments. I'll give you one quick example, and I may not have the details, so Vince may have to speak up, but door landing required some um, adjustments to the entrance exit and even a consideration to limit because of the number of uh, vehicles coming in at door landing. So we do have traffic studies as a requirement for any project. Okay, all right. Well, it'll be interesting to see what those traffic studies produce. And I would only ask that um, before you vote, because I think it's a foregone conclusion, we're gonna get this property developed and there's gonna be 27 homes and 27 times two, probably at least, cars that are traveling on 11th now. Um, you know, my driveway faces 11th. I sit and wait five minutes sometimes if I'm trying to leave my house at the wrong time of day to get out because everybody is running the stop sign at 11th and McDonald. And then they see the red light at Donnelly and they gun it to try to beat the light at Donnelly. I'm telling you, living on 11th is no treat. And your clients who are going to pay $650,000 to live on 11 are going to be disappointed when they can't get out of their driveway. At any rate, I would also like to know what the plan is for all of the construction vehicles that will be coming in and out. Are they going to come down Donnelly, turn right onto 11th, then go to that property? Are they going to come up uh, from Old 441 and Heim Road? onto 11th, because you're in a landlocked situation there. So, no matter which way all these vehicles are going, and all the dirt, and the noise, and the traffic, and the, the disruption, is going to affect everybody who lives on 11th. So, um, I think it's the least you could do, since nobody wants to listen to all of the people who are sitting here, who are opposed to the way this project is being rammed down our throats, and I have to say, it feels like it's being rammed down our throats, um, and we really have not been listened to. I think it's rather disrespectful, with all due respect. Um, but really, let's do a serious study on how, the, how this piece of property is going to be developed and what the impact on the lives of the people who live on 11th is going to be. Now, I don't know where any of you live. Kathy, I know where you live. I think you're our District 1 councilman. Where do you live? I live on Overlook. Okay, so you're going to be fighting traffic and noise and dirt and for how many years? How long is it going to take to develop, tw to build 27 homes? I don't know, maybe the developer has an idea how long it's going to take, but I have a feeling we're going to be living through at least 10 years of construction, noise, and dirt. There you go. Thank you, Jay. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> uh, Gordon Daniels, 601. Okay, 601 West Old Highway 441. I'm in the Hill House condominiums. Uh, I'm sitting here tonight. You know, we've been hearing so much politics, and it's even gotten to this level where we're attacking the greed of the church. We're oh, carpetbagger uh, developers and city council members who are greedy and just want more money in the coffers. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that it, it comes to this kind of language. Um, Charlie still wants that buffer move more towards Hill House, which means more erosion down onto our property. I'm sorry, but we're just beating this thing to death. You have a planning board. They made the uh, recommendations to you. You approved them last meeting. I think you need to follow through with that. Thank you. The young lady and then Mr. Masterson. How many young ladies are there? <laughs> <laughs> I consider you all young ladies. <laughs> all young ladies. We always want to be young ladies. Thank you very much. You just made my day. There you go. My name is. Gardner. I live on 1200 Gardner Street in the Highlands of Mount Dora. Uh, the last few times that there were meetings with the Planning and Zoning Committee was my first time to speak before them. I asked very specifically of Mr. Jankowski, 
if there had been a traffic study. He specifically told me, in a dismissal way, that it wasn't necessary, that the developer, developer had already provided one. <laughs> My plea is that somebody takes responsibility for this. I've lived here for 17 years. We were here when we tried very hard to get the stop sign on Gardner and 11th. Since then, I've quit walking my dog across the dog walk because we've been hit almost twice. That's not fair. It's not fair to the people who live there to have, what is it, 54 more cars coming through. And the way that I looked at it, and on the plan itself, along 11th, starting at the west, there's Overlook. Right next to that is Gardner. And within another 150 to 200 feet is the yet-to-be-named ingress-egress to the cottages. That's three major entrances in a very short distance. People come around that corner, they already go through the stop sign that's there. I can't walk my dog there anymore, I'm afraid to. And he's a rescue and he deserves to be able to walk there. So I'm asking you please, someone, take responsibility and look at this. Jankowski said they don't need a traffic study because the developer had already provided one. If that's true, I'd like to see it. Thank you, please. Thank you. Thank you. Evening. Mike Masterson, 787 Crosswinds Way. Uh, I think it might help if you if you explain to your constituents the authority that you have to change or not change a PUD request. How much power and how much ability you have to say, as Ms. Tillett said, I'd like to have 22 to 24. But it's my understanding is you all cannot tell them we'll only approve 22 to 24. If they fit the PUD request for a density, and if they fit the PUD, re PUD standards or for setback and boundaries, etc., I don't know if you all have a leg up to stand on to tell them, no, you can't build 27, you can only build 20, or whatever. Am I correct in any of those comments? Yes. Partially. There aren't necessarily PUD standards. That's what a PUD is. It's, mm -hmm. it's different based on the things, the nuances of the property right. and of the project. Right. Um, but if they do meet the density of what their current zoning is, which they do, then we would have, we'd be hard pressed to tell them, no, you can't develop 27 lots on the property. That's what I thought. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think if you had a more informed, if your people, your, your voters were, in, aware of that, they perhaps wouldn't question your heritage um, and or your, whether your, your pockets have gotten fattened because you all cannot restrict, uh, legally tell them no, 20 is all we'll approve and stand behind it without getting sued for giving them less than what they're allowed. So if you could do that, I think it might be beneficial or we all might have saying come by up by the end of the evening. Thank you. And yes, you are accurate. Anyone else wish to speak? Mary. <coughs> Mary Hatton, 601 West Old Highway 441. And I just wanted to assure Charlie that right behind us, you know, we're, we're a two-story. Directly behind us is a three-story house. There is a tall enough buffer that I don't know how long it's been there since when that house was built, but there's no vision in anybody's bedroom on any of the houses along the back. And we have a 15-foot buffer with uh, a small, you know, the wide driveway, which is, I believe, around 15 feet. Um, 
as far as the traffic issue that people keep mentioning, <coughs> predominantly around the events, we can thank advertising on Channel 9, and uh, which is bringing a lot of people into town for the events. That it's, it's not local traffic. There is local traffic, there's no doubt about it. I also have trouble getting out on 441, um, depending on which time of day when I head to work, because I'm not at home uh, all day long, uh, we're not working. But um, in talking to the developers, from what I understand is the, the option is two-story, single-story. It's not that they're all gonna be two-story homes. And when I drove down 11th after the last meeting, I noticed that from Donley, coming down 11th on the right, there are numerous setbacks. Not every one of those setbacks is exactly the same on either side of the street. I think the Wilson's home is barely, if it is 20 feet off from the sidewalk back to their porch. So I see this development, trying their, the developers trying their best to fit in on the 11th Avenue side into that neighborhood. It's a trans I see it as a transitional neighborhood between the 11th Donley to 11th and then the Fairview on. And then on the 441 side, it's also a transitional because it's a higher density, which goes along with the condos. And they're numerous on 441. So I would just like you to consider it. I feel like, you know, they've, they're with what Mr. Masterson just said very clearly is they're within their legal bounds. They, they have met the requirements, and you all certainly have the option to deny it, but I think they're, and I don't think they probably even fight you, but they are legally within their bounds according to what uh, Vince has been saying with uh, the zoning and what they're requiring and requesting. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haddon. Anyone else wish to speak? Can I ask, can I ask a question? All right, Frank Ford again. I'd like to know why the people in the Hill House are so for this. You've been the only people that have spoken up for this development the whole time. Everyone else seems to be against it. How about we run the entrance exit down there by your yeah. entrance exit? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. Well, I know, I know. I know. I mean, I, that's just a suggestion. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anyone else? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, David Jantz from Outdoor, 1755 Gertrude Place. Um, I live in an unincorporated area of Outdoor, but I am interested because I spend a great deal of my time uh, bicycling back and forth to Mount Dora, which I like to do, and it was brought up before the difficulties of 11th, and I sent some information to everybody today. Um, that makes me wonder what exactly uh, we are going to do with that additional density along there, because there's really only one route for a pedestrian or a bicyclist to get into Mount Dora from the west side of Mount Dora. Uh, the others are just impractical and very dangerous. The, uh, you have Old Eudora, um, I'm sorry, Eust Eustace Road, which is far too narrow now and far too dangerous probably for cars, much less a pedestrian or bicyclist, and very little that probably could be done to change that. Uh, 441, I'm sorry, Old 441, um, same thing. It's too narrow to do anything more with it. There's a lot of traffic on that, of course, coming into town. You can't bicycle on that, and there are no sidewalks at all to walk on either of those two roads I mentioned, and probably never will be. So the only road that really runs from the west side of Mount Dora and Sylvan Shores, etc., into town that gives people access to walk or bicycle is Leavenworth. And we're going to be adding considerable amount of additional traffic with this, without any doubt. Uh, because you can't just talk about how many houses are there and how many cars each house will have. But there's also delivery trucks, there's also friends and relatives visiting, there's going to be a lot of additional traffic in and out. And you've already got, as is mentioned here before, a single stop sign along there that isn't often obeyed. Um, I was questioning, you know, is there a thought of putting a traffic light in there someplace to stop that traffic when needed? 
Uh, are we going to match the egress to the new development so that you can have at least something there to control traffic in and out of the new development and the old developments that are there? Or is it just going to be free for all? And I think that's pretty much what we're going to end up with. A lot of people stuck trying to get onto or off of 11th. Uh, and unless we do an awful lot with the sidewalk along there to make that safer, that's the whole length, too, of the sidewalk along there. Uh, you're going to make it very difficult for people to do what a lot of people would like to do and should be doing, and that's getting some exercise by walking and bicycling in and out of Mount Dora to beat you, go to the shops, go to the restaurants, etc., and not have to use a car into what's a very already limited parking area in downtown. So that's my question. I don't know if you remember the questions I asked. Uh, I'd just like to see if anybody could answer any of those questions, if they would. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hayes. So um, as far as um, the traffic light or something of that sort, again, we have the traffic calming study, which will address, um, we've put some temporary speed bumps in certain locations. We actually have one coming in on 11th. Um, and again, the, the tra traffic calming engineer will tell us where we should place a speed bump, if one should be required, or anything else, whether it's a light or additional stop sign, or make recommendations to this board, and the board will have a chance to take that into consideration. Uh, we had several roads in the city that we're looking at, Clayton, Highland, um, Overlook, 11th, 9th, I think is another street we were looking at, um, as well as 5th and Donnelly. So those streets will be taken into um, consideration and presented back to the council as far as the study. Um, as, as far as sidewalks, again, we have a trail program. The trail program is really, at this point in time, it comes down uh, 0441. Um, the trail does include trails in that area that you're speaking of, of no being no sidewalks at this point in time. Um, I don't have a map of that yet because, again, it's still being designed. Um, economic development we've been presenting to the council on a steady basis um, would include those trails, and we're still proceeding with that. We do know that if we cannot um, maneuver um, the trail system down 0441, 11th and Heim, and some of those other locations to connect to the Tremaine Trail is the other option. So, again, we'll continue to have to study that. Um, we put, uh, council approved 200000 this year uh, for with the MPO to do that study, to perform that study. Um, we hope to have part of that study for the trails back in May thereabouts, and we'll uh, proceed from that point. So we are actually looking at all those programs. Good. Thank you. Um, I guess I would just like to add one more thing that I do have to stand behind what some people are saying, is that density does seem too high. Um, it's just my opinion. Uh, I think it needs to be developed, and it's going to be a, a beautiful place to develop. I'm sure it will be very popular. But it does sound like it might be a bit too much concentration that uh, could be a problem. Okay. Thank you. Quick question. <clears throat> Let me see. Is there anyone else who has not spoken yet who would like to speak? <coughs> yes. I'll come back over here after people who haven't spoken yet. My name is Alec Hawks and I live at 831 Fairview Avenue. At the last meeting, Charlie gave us a very well-reasoned presentation with certain amendments for the council to consider in addition to the other amendments that you have passed. I would appeal to you on behalf of many of the residents in the area to reconsider those proposals by Charlie before you make the final decision on the PUD. I'm inviting you now on behalf of many people to consider Charlie's recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dan Shiokum, uh, write the blog, FiscalRangers.com. I wasn't going to talk about this. I'm not a resident here. I'm at 12619 Tavares, so I'm an inter interloper. But uh, I just, you talk about traffic calming as maybe a mitigation for concerns over traffic. Uh, they did that in Tavares, in my opinion. They, uh, they tried retail, and a lot of people won't drive through Tavares anymore because of all those constant brick intersections and uh, slow and the traffic calming, because I, I was around when they did that. And so I would suggest that you keep that in concern, because if you have people on your west side that are driving through or businesses want them to drive through, 
and maybe you don't. I mean, there is another option, which is you put those in because you don't want people cutting through town. Uh, then that's part of your discussion, but just keep that in mind because, in my opinion, a lot of people now are bypassing Tavares, and so they ended up having to switch to entertainment because they couldn't get enough people coming down there for retail. Thanks, Vince. Uh, Josh. Josh Hemingway, 1177 East Fifth Avenue. I, I have a question, and I guess it probably is more directed to the developer. <clears throat> But uh, when you drive down the Lakeshore Drive of the old 441, you come to the Heron Key, which faces on there, and then you come to the Hill House and whatever other, and they comfortably manage to come onto that road. Uh, when you're on 11th, it is all houses, the driveways, and so we don't have anything that, uh, other than the property that's off on the other side. It, it, was it ever taken into consideration to put the, you know, the entrance and exit on old 441, it is a very large frontal, and it would be it would mirror exactly what's happening at the at the hilltop places. I you know it would seem if there was any way to move it to that road, it would alleviate a lot of problems for the people on 11. I don't know if this was ever considered. Um, so I do believe Vince can come up and speak to that, um, and then if he wishes to reach out to the developer, we can do that. Huh? It was considered at the preliminary stage. Um, o441 would be a, a difficult ingress egress. It's under Lake County's jurisdiction, but also the configuration of the existing conditions. It's a small footprint. There's a curve as you come around as you're leaving, and both sides with the topography um, it would need more engineering studies. Uh, it was looked at. It wasn't safe as initial uh, ingress for the subdivision, which was open, this isn't gated, so other residents could use that as well if it was a access from limit to, or 11th uh, to 0441. Uh, so it was considered, um, didn't seem safe, and would need considerable engineering. Thank you. I would just like to, I would just like to have one clarification uh, about something the Hill House people said. Um, the five feet that we're asking for um, is not going to shift anything towards Hill House or to the west. What we were proposing is that the lots that face east and west all have um, lengths of their, their sizes or, you know, uh, are 50 by 100 and something. The ones that face east and west are 50 by 155, 145. The, what I was thinking is to take five feet from one of those rows and put it on the buffer. That wouldn't be shifting any of the development any further to the west, to the east, east at all. It would just be a little bit less of a space for each of those little 50 by whatever they are, and he's saying that it would be great for uh, empty nesters that didn't want a lot of room in their, their homes. And I thought, well, going from 155 to 150 is not any big deal to be able to give the people on the other side a bit better expanse of feeling a little bit more distance from this development that's so alien to the people on, on the West, okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? May I speak as a resident? Well, we're... May I get up and speak as a homeowning resident of the city? You can give your opinion sitting on the dais, but you, you don't leave the dais during a meeting to speak as a homeowner. Okay. You can, but you are giving your opinion sitting up here as a homeowner as well. May I do that? We will when we come back to council, and then you can be first. How's that? Anyone else? Okay, we're back to council. Uh, Ms. Stiles, go first. I'm speaking to my council members as a resident. I purchased, uh, uh, sorry, Chrissy Style, 2016 Donnelly Place and 1850 Hilltop Drive. My council member Crail for my home on Donnelly Place and council member Tucker for my home on Hilltop Drive. My at-large representative, Mr. Massey, 
as well as the mayor, Ms. Hoax. When I bought my home on Donnelly Place over 14 years ago, it backed up to a quiet land full of orange groves. The most noise you ever heard were birds chirping. A couple years ago, I got a letter in the mail inviting me to attend a public meeting because the land was being developed into Dora Landings. Well, shoot, there goes the neighborhood. Over time, though, as the idea of 126 homes being built in my backyard started to sink in, I realized that this project is not as bad as it seems because it's in the right place. Dora Landings is just inside the northern border of the Northeast CRA. By definition, the purpose of a CRA is to improve the conditions of the area both aesthetically and through economic development. Again, it's in the right place. Some months ago, this council was asked to approve the Timber Walk subdivision, 376 brand new homes out on Round Lake Road. If there are 376 more families moving to Mount Dora, that is the right place to put them. What's before you again this evening is a request to look past our city's land development code, break the rules, if you will. Mr. Lightsey said himself in the last meeting they've never had to go through this many steps to begin a project. If the developer's plan fit this location, they wouldn't have had to spend so much time getting it approved. That's got to make you stop and think. Why has it been so difficult? Why are so many of our long-term residents so opposed to this project? Before the last meeting started, I overheard one of my fellow council members ask another council member, which agenda item are all these people here for? S still to this day, that blows my mind because as seven people representing the 14,526 people that live in this city, if at this time you don't know what these people are sitting for, shame on you. <laughs> The seven, of the, the seven members of this city council get to make this decision, and we can never go back. And I ask you not to change Mount Dora's character to meet this developer's needs, but instead consider the needs of the residents that have lived in the surrounding neighborhood for decades, not years, but decades. We live in this city. They don't. understand all of the concerns that I'm hearing here today, both pro and con, the vast majority are uh, opposed, but there are a number that are in favor. Um, so we have a dispute. Uh, when this was first presented to us at the first reading, uh, virtually the same number of the same people were here saying that they wanted certain changes. and. Based upon meetings at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting and at the uh, DRC and all these other meetings, that, plus the initial meeting that we had before it was a first reading, uh, changes that were advocated by those that are here today, the majority that are here today, most of them, or at least essentially the ones that I heard about, were accepted. In other words, the people that were advocating for some changes, the four things that were added, were based upon the input that I heard, and there were others, of course, that weren't added, but certainly somebody listened to the input from the public, both at the planning and zoning meeting and at the city council. So the first meeting of the city council said, we will approve this at the first reading with these four changes which occurred. So we've had good public input, but obviously insufficient public input from those that are here opposing this uh, uh, entirely entire project or having variations they're suggesting. The first suggestion that we had is when the first development came, when the first plan came, there was a 10-foot buffer to the west. So most of you here advocated for at least a 20-foot buffer. 20-foot buffer is what was included in the full one of the four additions. Now I'm hearing there should be a 25-foot buffer yes. uh, as a suggestion, or at least by some. I believe the developers, regardless of whether you want that development there, that development should be there, uh, we are 
limited by the land development comprehensive code involved and just as our city attorney has said that if they have complied with the density and other requirements that's not the only requirement that they've complied with the other requirements the law essentially requires us to approve it. Uh, it we may not like that but we cannot fly in the face in my view of the legal requirements that this city council faces under Florida law. Uh, the other thing that was urged, people sitting here urged to me when I made the view, uh, the uh, trip up there, the on-site visit, we we got to have bonding. We want we want to have them bonded. So that was satisfied by Mr. Sandersfeld, who said there will be bonding. The matter will be will have a, a bonding insurance support. I heard suggestions now today that if I four-foot sidewalk should be five feet. Well, that's fine with me. I don't care if it's a 20-foot sidewalk. Uh, if the Land Development Code and the Planning and Zoning Commission and all of that thinks that the developer should do the, they're going to do a sidewalk, if it should be five feet versus four feet, I'm all for that. The mail that I got between the last meeting and now essentially can distill them into one major issue, and that is, will there be impact, impact fees required? And in my response to each one that contacted me is, that's required by Florida law. So there will be impact fees, period. Whatever they are is what they will be. So it seems to me that the va other than don't do it, the vast majority of the, of the input that has been required of the developer has been complied with. Uh, people want smaller homes, okay. People last time have said, well, nobody's going to buy them. Is that, is that really a problem that we need to decide as a council, as a policy board, that we need to step in, in the developer's shoes and then say, well, I don't think you're going to be able to sell these homes. That's my judgment, and so we won't allow it. We can't do that. It's inappropriate. It's unlawful. So we can't put our place into the economic decision that developer makes. We can only follow the Land Development and Comprehensive Code, and we require on our good people at the Planning and Zoning Department to advise us as to what is appropriate, and they have done so. So, the other thing that, that I'm pleased to hear about is that, I believe Mr. Sandersfeld said, there's a continuing reviewing standard when the design is design plans move forward at the planning and zoning department and all those there will review the details step by step month to month for these design standards as they do in all planned unit developments that satisfies me now a, a few of you i have heard say a few of those speaking i've heard say planned unit developments puds are bad and I've heard some not-so-kind comments about people who live in PUDs. Um, I live in a PUD. One of my other fellow council members lives in a PUD. In the country club of Montdora, we have approximately 2,000 people that are honorable citizens, tax-paying citizens that live in a planned unit development and like it that way. So I have no problem with a PUD. I know you don't think it, most of you don't think it should be in that area. I understand that. Uh, The last comment that I heard that was a little disturbing is that somehow the developer or the city or the whomever is ramming this down our throat. Uh, I don't believe that's true. Uh, I understand the uh, emotion connected with all this, and so I, I don't take personal offense at being saying I, I'm I'm weak and as, a, as one of seven weak and don't know how to make my own decisions and somebody else is ramming this down my throat. But nobody is ramming this down my throat and we have seven independent people who are will vote today and nobody's going to ram that down their throat. They're going to make their own independent decisions. So I, I don't think that's a correct comment. The main thing is to me is from a legal standpoint and I, I respect the law based upon my background, 
I follow the law as best I can. We have a duty once all of these things have satisfied to follow the law, whether we at the council like it or not. We can vote as we wish, but there are risks in saying they've stepped through all of the hoops, the developers, and now we're going to deny them that. I think that's a legal risk I'm not willing to make. I support <coughs> the second reading. I made the motion for the first reading, and I support the second reading. There have been additional uh, support for what they're doing uh, through the Planning and Zoning Department, and uh, I'm satisfied with what's been done, and I wish them the best if, if this is approved, and if it's not, that's the way this council votes. So I appreciate listening to me. I, I am a little disappointed at some of the personal comments uh, that were that were made, but I can understand that. And I certainly understand it based upon the emotions that I hear today. So thank you for listening, and I appreciate your comments as well, every one of you. Thank you. Ms. Burnett. Ex parte communication first. I met with Dennis Casey, and I... Okay. Okay, I'll get closer. Is that right? <laughs> All right, so I met with Dennis Casey, and I received emails from uh, the constituents about um, their concerns. Were the emails that you received to you personally, or were to the, they, they were, were to, to all the council. council? They were to all the council. Um, I did receive uh, one about impact fees, which was a response to my 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 uh, thank you so that was that was the extent of the uh, emails and who was that email exchange with the individual that um, had a personal email with you Nancy okay yes um, <clears throat> my concern is so I, I in in my um, in my meeting with Dennis, I was pleased to see that all the houses there were on one level, and and the response was, well, we're we're retired people, and we only want one level because we are. <laughs> so that was pretty interesting to me, and the other. The other thing that I noticed um, was that there was a lot of parking on the street <coughs> excuse me, because the street was pretty wide and I don't think that that's going to be the case in this particular development that we're, that we're talking about, this, the, the cottages development. I don't know about the boulevard, <coughs> excuse me, that's going to go down the lake, excuse me, but I, I think it's going to be a two-lane road, and I think it's going to be both directions, and I don't think there's going to be parking on it. I don't know for sure. So when I visited Dennis's house, I noticed that, the, that there was parking on the street, and the, that there was a two-lane road, and there was parking on the other side of the street. So those are, and, and so I did hear from the constituents today, this evening, about the traffic study and the traffic problems. And that is my concern. I, I'm very concerned about parking and traffic. I, I don't understand how, I do not understand that we have had the traffic calming study. I don't, and I do understand that the developer has run their own traffic study, but I don't know that we have had a traffic study for that particular part of the world of Montour. I don't know that we've had a traffic study. I know that we've had a traffic calming study. I don't know about that. <coughs> so. I'd have to ask Vince to come up and provide you the exact type of study, a traffic study and or definition of what was performed, Vince, please. 
I'm not a traffic engineer, so this is going to be a benefit. Um, so it'll be layman's terms. Um, at the preliminary stage, there was a traffic, traffic analysis of de minimis because the lots do not trigger a full-blown analysis, what we call a traffic study. Um, so that wasn't triggered with this. Normally you'd see that in door landings or the Lake Amount door where they'll have a full report. It's voluminous. Right. In this case, that wasn't done because the number of units was less than our code. Our code has ordinance regulations on when one is required. And because of the scientific terms of the distribution of traffic on the street wouldn't trigger improvements that trigger that study not. Uh, staff did ask as discussion during the preliminary HUD um, and it came up again at the final of this traffic. Uh, that's something that could be built into the final master plan and the burden on the applicant could you could as council as your wishes to impose a traffic study for the impacts of this development. You would be difficult to say I'd like a traffic study that side of town. Um, that probably would be maybe the city attorney could weigh in, but I think that we would be hard case to say like a whole regional, you know, all the way up to um, you know the north side of town and so forth where you, you're extended boundary. So that would be difficult, but one could prepare. However, the conclusions will probably be the same. Uh, the distribution of uh, turning lanes or improvements to intersections or so forth will come out of that probably would be still the same. Just to, But one could get that analysis from a traffic engineer. Our traffic engineer would review that, so it would be an independent consultant second-hand to look at that study through report. So that could be imposed as part of the final PUD requirement at the time the engineering drawings were submitted if you needed some more comfort level and distribution of traffic. That's all. Any other comments? No. Mr. Tucker. Yes, I was not at the last meeting, as it was pointed out to me in several emails. <laughs> uh, so I'm here now. I've, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, things that were brought to my attention, I brought to the city's attention and the developer's attention. And uh, listening tonight, I, uh, like Mr. Ralston, was somewhat disappointed in some of the uh, understood why it happened, but somewhat disappointed in some of the rhetoric that uh, was unneeded. Uh, cannot speak for anybody else on the council. But I think during my three years on council, I voted about as independently as anybody could vote. Uh, it's been pointed out to me by several people that were surprised by some of my votes. And I, uh, I've listened. The only thing that uh, is really so I've heard about the tra traffic, and I've heard about tonight people talked about the construction. How long is that construction going to take? The truck's coming up. Well, when you look at the development on Gardner, there's 21 or 22 homes in there. 19. Pardon me? 19. 19. Okay, 19. I don't know how long that took to be developed. I also don't know what the neighbors said when that was going to be developed. You know, I don't know if there was a uproar in council when that was being developed. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, when the condos were developed there in Hilltop. Yeah, I don't know if there was an uproar at that. I mean, when Mount Dora was founded, I don't know if anybody said, well, it's going to be the home of some condos. Does that fit in with the neighborhood? But it fits in now. Uh, I understand the fears. I understand the concerns. But I, um, I am the only thing I really have heard that I would like to say if I was in a perfect world is we could expand the buffers a little bit more if possible. I think that'd be nice. But if it can't be, it can't be. I think the developers have bent over backwards <coughs> to meet you know, at some, you know, keep the playing field a little bit level. It's a uh, and yes, I, you know, they've gone from 10 to 20 feet. They've added some parking. They've added some other things. I believe the egress and the, uh, they've changed the one entrance. So they have listened. Now with the uh, the walking, 
with my, I walk those streets. My bride walks them three days a week. And uh, I used to walk a lot more than I do. I used to walk from uh, Overlook up to uh, uh, Donnelly and back. And I did that pretty regularly until the last seven or eight months when I've got some other stuff that has uh, stopped me from doing it. And I've noticed the traffic increase. I also notice, you know, you can walk on these sidewalks. And if they're going to be expanded a little bit, great. If they're going to be wide. I don't understand the uh, uproar over the bikes and the walking on those. I don't see how that's going to change a whole lot. The cars aren't going to be driving down their sidewalks. So you're still going to have that room one there. So that I don't understand. I would, uh, the development that's coming in is different. It's, it may not fit the quasi-essential, our view of what a home in Mount Dorsey should look like. My home was built in, you know, 1953. It doesn't look like the home that was built in 1926 across the street from me. And by the same token, there's a new home that, that's going in down the street from me that's not going to look like my home. Yeah, uh, home styles change a little bit. So it's, you know, it's part of development. It's part of growing. The traffic, it may be 54 cars, maybe 35 cars, maybe people coming and going. I've got a gentleman that just moved in down the street from me that has six cars in his driveway of all times. You know, I don't know what he's doing. I don't know if he's got four kids and everybody has a car or what. But I'm not about to play the... Uh, car place to say, no, if you move them out door, you got to have one car or two cars. Yes, there is a problem on Overlook. I mean, not Overlook, but on 11th Avenue with traffic. And from the event last, uh, I guess it was the light-up, going home, there was cars parked all the way down 11th on that church property, on the Orange Grove property. Well, if that's developed, they're going to have to park somewhere else. People are off 11th because they won't be parking there. Uh, so, you know, I, I understand your concerns. I mean, I live in the neighborhood. You know, I do. But what we all have to look at, and I know what I have to look at, I have to represent both my constituency and District 3. I also have to represent the city. And sometimes it's a bitter pill. You know, it's, you can't make everybody happy. And I would love to make everybody happy all the time. If I could wave a wand, I'd do it. But it's, you know, it's just, we all have to look, and then, you know, it's a fear, I believe it's a fear of the unknown. This, the city is changing. And as much as uh, we all moved here for one reason or another, and I've heard about every reason you could hear, I've been here 20 years. I probably have been here as long or longer than some of y'all sitting in the audience. Uh, I don't know that, but I, I know I've been here as long as all my council members say the mayor. I think I've been here longer than anybody. So, uh, and you can rest assured, and this is as an entity, as a city, where they have to grow a little bit with some growing pains. Or the city will die. There's no ends. You can't stay stagnant. You stay stagnant, you become the rest belt. And that's pure and simple. Um, now we have to just don't grow to grow. But as far as this development, and I'm, I've talked to the developers, I've talked to Reverend Moore, I've talked to <coughs> residents. I've heard all sides. I've done my own homework. So, um, with that, I've talked enough. Uh, Councilmember Tucker, did you have any ex parte that you would like to disclose to Council? No, uh, not really. It's, everything has been in the past, with the exception of uh, Reverend Moore. Let me, if I might, uh, Madam Mayor, disclose again between the last meeting and now 
the three that I forgot to say. Okay. Well, yeah, every other email has been. Finish. Yeah, every other email has been to the group, with you know, yeah. except for some <coughs> residents over there, and then nothing since the last vote. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm sorry to you. I've had three, uh, David Jans, uh, Amber Antonio, and Sue Jans, uh, I think are the ones. I, the I think these are the ones that we've all got. We all got yes. these. Okay. We all got these. Okay. And yeah. you had nothing separate from the... No, no. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Crow. Mr. Massey. I've received the same emails. I didn't respond because I knew we would air those issues tonight. Uh, I welcome you to city government at work. You've had a ringside seat. Uh, in my view, the city staff has listened. The contractor has listened. There has been a balancing of interest in this process. Some of you may go away unhappy with the outcome, but it is city government at work. Uh, the comments of my compatriots, uh, Mr. Ralston and Mr. Tucker, pretty much summarize my comments. Uh, so I'm going to adopt with those, adopt those, and be quiet. There are a couple of things that I want to say. Uh, a lot of concern about sidewalk and bicycle and pedestrian traffic. I want to remind all of you that one of those conditions that is a part of this agreement is that the there, there will be a replacement of that sidewalk adjacent to this development along 11th Avenue, and it will be five feet wide. So those of you who have concerns about that, it's a part of the requirement on this one contractor. I've listened to your concerns about traffic. I personally don't think that uh, the number of homes in this development will cause a huge impact. I think part of the accommodation by the uh, contractor developer will cause uh, some traffic change that you didn't anticipate. The contractor accepts a great deal of expense in agreeing to transport off-site all the refuge that is generating from tearing out that orange grove. We have, as a city, had several projects where we have had orange grove uh, removal and it was burned in, an, a, in a safe and approved manner on-site. And I understand who people who live in this close area, this residential neighborhood, may not want that. The contractor has agreed to transport and haul that. That will increase traffic on your street on 11th Avenue. That's all a part of the deal. The contractor has acquiesced and will agree to bear the expense to load, move, and dump and dispose of the vegetable, uh, the, uh, the produce that comes off the, the, uh, that site. I, I understand your concerns about traffic uh, and uh, concerns about parking. Uh, there are two car garages in each of these units, and there's a two car parallel, or rather side by side parking in the driveway for each. That's four parking spaces for each of those residents. I think parking concern uh, is a red herring. I think that's met by the plan here. Uh, we had some concerns about delivery vehicles in and out of there, construction vehicles in and out of there. The turn radiuses have been adjusted for that. I'm satisfied with that in the engineering and design of the plan. Uh, I know that there are continuing requirements that must be met by the developer as we go forward, but uh, I, I will support that to move forward. I have concerns about traffic because, in my own experience, traffic in this general area has increased, and I'm sure all of you feel that way. There are times when I have difficulty crossing Fifth Avenue at Grandview. Someday we're going to have to look at more traffic lights. As a council member, I will tell you that we, I individually, will push for and make certain that we address the traffic issues for the future. If we don't do that, but we need to do it for the city as a whole. We can't do it just on this little area of 11th. We've got to address direct access thoroughfares across this town or we'll choke to death in traffic as we go forward. And, and as a councilman, I will assure you that that will be something that I will push for, something we'll ask for funding for so that we do an overall traffic study to be sure that we're meeting the requirement and anticipating our future. I appreciate your involvement. Uh, we have listened. I think staff has listened. I'm satisfied that developer has listened and has made uh, all the reasonable accommodations that they can at this point. Thank you. Anyone else who wish to speak? I'm not going to duplicate what's already been said. 
Um, I do believe we have tried to listen. Um, uh, we have allowed everyone to speak as much as they've wanted. It was disappointing that there were some comments that were inappropriate in my view. Um, we all live in this town together and we all love this town and I do, as the rest of the council people do, want to look at what's best for the council. I mean what's best for the... Um, what's best for the community. And um, we've all probably investigated this particular thing in much more depth than a lot of other things. I can tell you I have in the short period of time I've been back and I've been to the site just like everyone here. I've been to Winter Park. I've listened. I've read. I've read articles. But it all comes back to a, a point where I do believe things have been negotiated of those that could be. And there have been concessions. And we listen to those concessions. Um, and we do have parameters we have to follow. And perhaps we weren't as forthcoming in making you aware as clearly because we are aware of what the, the framework we're working in in the documents that are in place within the law as Mr. Rolfson so eloquently discussed because that's part of what we have to take the responsibility for. I believe the traffic discussions is another whole issue. What the impact may or not, may not be from the, these 27 homes, I believe the issue is bigger than this particular um, development. Um, and I think the message I'm hearing, and I hope, I believe I'm hearing it also from my fellow council members, is that we need to make the studies a priority. And it sounds to me like it needs to be a very comprehensive approach rather than segmented approach. So I think we need to go back as a council and look at what we have in the budget, what our timing is, and how we can do that. Because I think there's a number of things that have probably impacted. Um, I do believe we need to have a plan, and I know staff heard the discussion a couple of meetings ago, that as we have a number of different developments starting um, to go to their next stages, there's going to be an increased activity within what is relatively the core, and it's a pretty large core, when you look at, you look from limit um, and then down to 11th Avenue and, and what we have going on around. So that's another whole um, view we have to take that's going to need to be comprehensive so that as the traffic flows in and out of Mount Dora, uh, but we are transitioning. I think what we have to focus on is to continue to maintain the integrity of the historic component and um, the lifestyle that we try to do while we are seeing some development. Um, because I don't, I, I heard a comment that downtown's not vibrant. I guess I disagree with that. I think downtown is very vibrant. And I know I haven't lived here as long as a number of you all out there have. I've been here 35 years. And I've seen downtown go through a lot of transitions. And Bobby, you're shaking your head because you know too you've been here. And I think we're much more vibrant than we were. And yes, we, we had challenges. I'm going to get off this subject just a little bit. But we did have challenges with our three events. And we're coming off of them, so you're feeling them as residents. Uh, yes, Renee's rolling her eyes back there. Um, all three of the community, the Christmas events, were bigger than they've ever been before. And that's the good news, bad news, because it affected our quality of life. So we have a challenge of looking at how to begin addressing that, because um, it needs to be addressed. But that's a separate subject, so I'll go back to this. So with that, I call for the question. I move approval of two, the Ordinance 2019-20. Second. Okay, motion is second. Roll call, please. Am I able to amend that motion? Well, yeah. I mean, plus I had another question okay. before it went so fast to a motion. I had my hand. I don't know well, I didn't see your hand, so. but that's all right. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Tucker said it went down to one entrance. Is that true? No, he's, I think he said it went down to one entrance and half of another. It went from two full to one and a half. Okay, and then right? the other one is in and out. Um, I just wanted to clarify some, a point that Mr. Masterson brought up that, that we should clarify exactly what is being asked for here. And I understand that it's it, it's not in our legal capacity to say there, we can't allow 27 homes because that's the what the density allows for that property. But understand that this PUD is asking for concessions from what the current zoning is. Current zoning is R1A, a lot width of 90 feet. They're asking for 50 feet. 
and a lot width. The lot size is currently 10,000 square feet. They're asking for 5,500 5, square feet. The setbacks, the front, the side, the rear, and the corner, they're asking for less of a setback on each of those measurements. So, and, and my mind is blown how, how all of you can say, I understand everything you just said, but I move to approve this without any, any further changes. So, so everything that was just said, how much of a traffic problem this is going to cause, how much of, how much this development is not going to fit where it's being developed, but we're not going to entertain any changes. I, I understand that we can't touch the density, but my, my initial question to Mr. Lightsey was the setbacks, and they're asking for a concession on the setbacks, and I would like to see a number put on those setbacks before I approve this, and I, I don't know what just happened that we went from here's more discussion to an immediate motion that I can't amend. Okay. We have a motion on the table, and we have a second. And your motion was to accept the... My motion was to approve for second reading ordinance 2019-20. There have been no changes since the first one, since the first reading. And Ms. Tucker, you seconded. Yes. Now, it sounds like Ms. Stiles wants to amend that, but if she was wants to do that, then the two people making the motion have to agree to the amendment. That is correct. And she has to specify exactly what she wants to amend, and then they would have to agree Both to it. Both agree to it. Yes. Uh, I would like to amend the motion that is on the table to include a 40-foot setback for the line of homes that face West 11th Avenue. I do not agree to the amendment. Okay, Mr. Rolson will not agree to that. Mr. Tucker? Yeah, not being a builder, I can't agree to that either. I so now you can call the question if you'd like, yeah. or you can uh, you can withdraw your motion. No, I won't withdraw my motion, and I move the previous question. Okay, roll call vote. Oh, uh, Mr. Rolfson? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Crail? Yes. Ms. Stile? No. Ms. Burtnett? No. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mayor Hope? Yes. Thank you all for coming. Shame on all of you. What? I'm not staying till the midnight show? We'll take a five minute break. Everybody Public Works Facility, Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Um, what we've tried to provide you this evening is um, really just some information, and we have two members of our staff here. We have Vince Sandersfield here to answer questions in reference to the property status and, and so forth. We also, Amy Jules here with Leisure Service to talk about um, an opportunity for pickleball courts there. Um, I'd like to just run through quickly what we provided you so that, again, I think it's for your discussion and we will we'll be glad to answer questions. Staff has given you the data. Um, there are several attachments in here. Um, you have a letter from uh, some pickleball uh, members um, in the community um, in reference to the courts. You've got a couple drawings on the courts. You have the Lake County Tourism Development Capital Projects. If we do go forth on the pickleball, we have to respond very quickly. We have a, a January date, line, date time in which we have to meet um, in order to, or February, January, February, okay, February, um, in order to apply for grant monies. We've also provided to you, that's in attachment four, um, we also have an attachment five, um, a capital improvement summary, again, part of the, uh, uh, the Parks and Rec master plan. Uh, we have uh, some dollar uh, discussions in, in number six, attachment six, in reference to um, the, sorry, I can read it, the Mount Dora golf course and the pickleball, basically reflecting the funding that you've put in place for the current year. Attachment um, in seven has a line eyes. Attachment seven is in reference to the uh, northeast um, CRA. We've looked at the vacant lands there because uh, from a staffing perspective, we do feel like that 
um, if we're going to look at workforce homes or affordable homes, we have some vacant land we need to infill in that area. Um, I had the great pleasure, I'll just mention very quickly, to meet uh, with uh, Winter Park Housing Authority, some of the executives there. They're very interested in being a partner with Mount Dora. They build the homes, we just supply the land. Um, so there's some partnerships we can look at in the future. We believe that's a, a good opportunity rather than rather than looking at that four acres as a work site for homes, we feel like the infill would be more beneficial to the Northeast community. Um, and then uh, eight is a, a future land use map. Again, Vince can answer your questions. So we provided you the information. Amy and Vince are here to answer your questions um, after you've had discussion if you have any of them. Mayor. Okay, and the, the essence came from this came that once we cleared that land, everybody was looking at how are we going to use it and the conversations were starting in different uh, arenas. My concern is that as conversations happen, people be, be, begin taking ownership as if it's theirs and we really need to talk about at this table what are all the options and give staff some direction based on the input that they're, they've given us. Um, and I knew of the two, there may even be more, but I knew there was a lot of discussion about how it might be used uh, for recreation, specifically pickleball. And then the other one, having sat on the Northeast CRA and also the recent um, community meetings and things, the discussion about housing and how we might look at affordable housing um, for our community. So with that, that's kind of where we asked um, Ms. Hayes and her staff to at least put some stuff together so that we can talk and then as it happens, um, there is this grant out there that if we were feeling strongly um, and leaning towards the um, event of, of uh, addressing the pickleball uh, courts that we might have opportunity for some funding um, um, with the county. So with that, um, it's open for discussion now so that we can um, get the information we need to give the staff some direction. Mr. Tucker. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, pickleball may be great, but are we going to talk to the residents in the Northeast about the pickleball and what they may want to do in that area or are we going to talk to the get NECRA involved with that and just so we're just not imposing what we think. The is intent right. tonight is for us to talk about what we might think and then we, we definitely would include NECRA and, and the community. In fact, some of us have been going to community meetings and listening to what the community is saying and, and, and the in, interest in affordable housing. Um, and actually at one meeting, um, Pastor Rowe, there was a gentleman there from Miami talking about wanting to build houses. So, you know, there has been some discussion already. So this is the opportunity for council to hear from staff and, 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 um, and talk about what we think to start out with. And then there's, this is the beginning of a process, but I wanted it to start out before people were already dividing it up as if it was going to happen. And that's what does happen. <clears throat> Amy Jewell, Leader Services Director. I just wanted to get a little bit of an explanation because it looks like an overwhelming amount of pickleball information and it's because that's what's going on up here. <laughs> um, the pickleball players have been chasing pickleball courts for since I've been here and they haven't really had an opportunity to have their voice heard. Um, we've done it through focus groups, but really what it comes down to every time is the lack of land. So we just wanted to be able, the staff wanted to just be able to put this concept out there to say, okay, here's land, here's a major need that's in the community, and here's all the information that we have to back, to back it up. Um, the Lake County Tourism Grant is the grant, the, the application due date is February 21st. And ultimately what we're hoping to get from the discussion is, is this even something that we should invest any staff resources into applying for? Um, is this a direction that we want to go? Because a requirement of the, of the county grant would be that we kind of have an idea. And um, I agree with you, we need to fully vet this out through all the different community groups. But we just want to feel we would need to start the application process pretty immediately after the holidays to start gathering that information and, and trying to figure out some of the data that they would need but I, I think also, Ms. Jewell, though, um, the master plan really spoke of this property as a continuation of a park system that we have. And um, I think that, again, we brought to you the master plan for adoption, um, and we've adopted it, and that's really what it 
that's kind of the direction it led us in because of the other parks that we have there. We have tennis courts, we have racquetball courts, we have the disc golf, we have additional courts, then we have a pool system. Um, so uh, again, the recreation master plan does uh, move you in that direction. Um, and I think that's that was kind of our, 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 our basis. We would expect that we would have focus group meetings and other discussions. Obviously, the Northeast uh, CRA needs to be involved in that. Um, they've been involved up to now, and they would continue to be involved. Um, and then, uh, again, to support that master plan, Amy, go over this, this map. But this was really, I thought, one of the pieces that um, made sense by looking at this map and addressing um, how we implement that master plan to the next stage. So this is a really, really, really rough draft. There's, I can chop it up and tell you all kinds of reasons why some of the things on this won't work, and GAI would be insanely embarrassed if they knew that I had even said this to anybody. But um, starting from the left, that's where you see the public works facility, and they've kind of drawn out a basic idea of how many courts, even, even with that, it's, they're set in segments of eight, and really it should be segments of six, but it shows you um, where some of the parking could lie, and then it butts right up against the tennis courts. Um, they've got the road there that looks like they're trying to stop the road. I wouldn't recommend that. I think that road should probably still go through and we would keep the racquetball court there. Um, and then you run right into really what I'm showing you this for is so that you can kind of see how the, the whole park would flow. Um, because you do have the disc golf course that takes up that big area. Um, they're looking at um, where the large stormwater pond is that has the really beautiful chain link fence around it. <laughs> um, we can redirect that water. They feel very confident after talking to some of our city engineers that that can be redirected into much smaller retention ponds and then allow for parking, maybe make that into a community center there that would actually serve the Northeast community during the week and then possibly a tournament venue in the sense of you've got your pickleball players out there, we've got our disc golf um, courses which are in combination with the, or in collaboration with the county as well. And we're, doing a good job of trying to attract more tournaments for that, as well as the baseball fields. And then um, on the far right is the mountain bike trail, which is starting to get quite a bit of attention. And we do already draw a large crowd from outside the community. So then they've allowed for parking Amy, for some of those. see that the bike or the, the mountain bike trail is? It's actually down here on the bottom. It's not on the map. It would be down at the bottom okay. right. Gotcha. Because it's next to the dog parks. Yep, thank you. So they've, they've expanded the um, parking to meet uh, 350 parking spots, keeping in mind they're also thinking shuttling for special events from a parking area. Um, and they've got the ball fields that they've stretched out and turned it, uh, added an additional field to meet the needs of the growing Bay Ruth Leagues. And then um, we've got this kind of Tootsie Roll thing looking through there. It's parking that's been added that would be a through road to, the, to Lincoln. The dog park would be slightly reduced, but not to a point that it would um, have any a negative impact on the dog park. And then, as I mentioned, you've got the Ice House Theater and the um, mountain bike trail. So like I said, this is, especially the roads, I would probably make some other recommendations, but it was more to just show you the flow of how um, the park would just roll right into that property. And again, not trying to push you one way or the other, just it's an opportunity and I um, wanted to make sure that um, the thoughts of the pickleball players. We've tried to meet their needs through modifying the Donnelly um, Park courts. Um, we've done everything that we can down there. The, the tennis court, we can't eliminate the tennis court. We still have a lot of tennis players. The direction of the courts doesn't meet um, the requirements. It gets The sun is in their eyes and all that kind of thing. Um, we, as you all know, we looked at the Mount Dora Golf Association. Um, even in a perfect world, that isn't the, the best setup for the pickleball courts and for a tournament venue. They would be really spread out and um, we'd, we'd, it'd be a shortage. We'd, we'd have definitely some challenges out there. So this piece of land out of everything that we've seen, we have a lot of property, but we don't have a lot of flat, pro flat park property that would um, lend itself to 18 to 24 pickleball courts. Again, I think that the, the master plan we went through, we did have the focus group, so we have the survey information. We have the information that was provided during that process, so we would have that to bring back. I, I still think some, some other types of open community meetings are necessary, and again, some meetings with the Northeast, but we do feel that um, from the use of the land, that's an opportunity to use it for, you know, to use the, this property for that. Um, obviously, 
There were other um, interests. Um, we looked at the um, the infill of or the the need for workforce homes and looking at that from an infill perspective. Um, I don't know how many homes I could get on four acres, fifty, uh, but they would probably be row style homes. Um, I would think in that area, very little yard. Um, but uh, again, it's not set up as residential. It is set up as a park. It is zoned as a park. Again, you have an opportunity to change that if you wish to do so. Again, we just gave you the details and the, and the, the current um, setup of that property. I'd like to open the discussion, uh, if I may, with a confession. I'm a pickleballer, a neophyte, uh, but a pickleballer. Uh, and I will tell you that it's the fastest growing sport in the U.S. It appeals to all ages. Uh, even I can play pickleball as old as I am. Uh, I don't run down every shot, but I can play pickleball. Uh, if we are a healthy, vibrant community, we need to address our needs for recreation, and this is one of those. And this is not a money pit. This has the potential for earning revenue for the city that is astronomical in terms of its popularity and growth and in terms of its ability to draw people in. When I met the pickleballer crew, uh, I don't know when I've ever been so warmly received and welcomed. The sport teaches you patience and humility because you embarrass yourself every time. Uh, <coughs> but the folks were encouraging, supportive, uh, and, uh, and committed to, uh, to the sport and to introducing that sport in a pleasant way to others. Uh, this group that exists in our community is active on country club courts and on our courts in Donnelly. The courts in Donnelly are so heavily used uh, that you lose patience sitting waiting for an opportunity to play. Uh, the play is dominated down there by people who are very good at it and they intimidate the neophyte uh, from even attempting it down there. And you find a very nurturing group and a group that is playing at country club. Uh, the, uh, the pickleballers among themselves have someone who is well qualified to instruct and train at this point. I know because I've had a, a lesson. Uh, they also have people who volunteer to assist in the operation of tournament play, people who are experienced in that. Uh, and I would ask my fellow council members to uh, to do a search of pickleball on YouTube and look at some of the YouTube uh, videos of tournament play, you'll be very impressed. Uh, there are those in the pickleball community who can tell you far more about the potential for draw and the numbers in terms of the kind of revenue that is out there, but this represents a draw for the city of Mount Dora, for a tourist draw. Mount Dora doesn't have enough motels, and that's going to come as 441 is developed. Uh, and we're going to have elder towners coming to uh, play various sports and activities and involved in all the things that we do in Mount Dora. Uh, and this is one of the things that would, uh, would be nice in terms of keeping our community young and active and athletic and fit. Uh, it's, it's an easy sport for, uh, it's an easy game to learn, it's a hard game to master, I'll put it that way. Uh, my thoughts about discussion between this area uh, the 4.3 acres that was the public works facility, and I'm so glad to see that eyesore gone. Um, it's my personal feeling that putting uh, low cost or workforce housing in that particular square carries with it a social stigma. The same social stigma that goes with, uh, with the government subsidized housing now on uh, Lincoln and Grandview. Uh, you don't pass there without thinking to yourself, that's, that's low-cost housing. Uh, and, and that's not very attractive. That's not very uh, homogeneous to our community. It's, it's a necessity, but it's, it's not pleasant to deal with in the same vein. If we, in looking at the map that the city staff has presented for us, uh, could, uh, could come up with a plan to uh, seize upon lots of vacant and idle lots in our northeast section, it would, it would appeal to me to, to consider doing individual houses on lots that are large enough for the homeowner to take pride in what they do and feel like they're part of the community. And at the same time, the, and, and, and Amy, I understand that this is a concept that you've offered us, and it's, it's great help in terms of my looking at what the Lincoln Park area can be in terms of a recreational resource. It's so disjointed now and so big and spread out and 
it's not it's not cohesive it doesn't really suggest a, a mindful approach to uh, to athletics uh, but this concept is terrific uh, the northeast community would benefit economically by bringing people in out of towners for tournament play uh, in this sort of a setting uh, the spill over to the community in terms of uh, of restaurants and businesses and and places to stay, uh, I, I think the uh, I think it's a nice marriage, uh, and I realize it's all my view because I'm prejudiced about pickleball, but uh, I think it's a concept that I would urge all of you to consider and and brainstorm. I think it has great promise. I think it's one of those things that could be a a, a flagship enterprise for the city of Mount Dora. It's one of the things that would make Mount Dora stand out as someplace special. Mr. Crow. Uh, another uh, admitted pickleball um, parlor um, as well. Um, I really support the idea of um, affordable housing. Um, and I agree with Ms. Mr. Massey. I, I, I'm looking at all those little um, purple spots there, and I, and I like the idea of infill on this block and one around the corner and so on and so forth. Um, the renovation and expansion of uh, a, a park, um, I love the idea. I, I, I think we have a better than middling opportunity to get those tourism dollar grants. And again, like we talked about earlier tonight, multiply our uh, buying power. Um, and this property wants, oh, oh, the other thing I was going to mention from um, putting on my educator hat here, um, it's a block and a half from the middle school and not very far from the high school, and it always occurs to me that uh, those courts, like the swimming pool or the softball field, whatever, um, would be fabulous for phys ed classes. This is definitely, if, if, uh, Mr. Massey and I can play, uh, imagine, a 14-year-old. Um, but it, it doesn't take a lot of equipment. It's walkable. And, and that's another set of citizens that I think could use it. So I'm in full support. This property wants to be a park. Thank you. Mr. Wolf. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, well, I'm going to be an exception only in one area, and that is... I don't play pickleball because I can't play pickleball. <laughs> With left and right hip surgeries, uh, my physicians would say, over my dead body, yeah. am I supposed to play pickleball? But I'm an avid sports fan and played tennis. And before pickleball, it was tennis in high school and college and wasn't too bad at it. So I understand how great that would be to do that. Uh, I want to remind everybody, uh, Mr. Massey touched on that a bit. What was there before? That four plus acres was, I can say it now, a rat infested, algae infested, mold infested building with underground gas tanks and fuel tanks that if I lived in that area would have been an absolute embarrassment to live there. It was dangerous, it was an eyesore, it, I mean, I personally toured that place at the request of, at that time, John Peters, who said, oh, you've got to see this building. I didn't know what he meant. And now I do, or then I did once I saw it. I think if I were a, in, an official in a, in a county or city health department, I would have condemned that thing about 10 years ago because it was a terrible thing to maintain, but it had its purpose, and I can say that now. <coughs> Now that it's gone. So whatever would be added there, whether housing or, or pickleball courts or some third choice, is going to be a benefit to the surrounding community, period. No exceptions, in my view. I, I know if, we, if this goes forward as kind of in this direction, that um, visiting with the Northeast community will be important. And they'll have an opportunity to weigh in and should weigh in, and I, and I want to see that, uh, the, the, um, the uh, Northeast CRA and the neighbors, and I'm sure that'll happen. I have visited with pickleball <coughs> aficionados that 
live close to me, and uh, they have convinced me, uh, in addition to Mr. Massey's articulate and Mr. Crail's articulate pickleball commentaries, they have convinced me this is the place to go. This is the thing to do. Uh, I believe, uh, and I'm convinced based upon the research I've done both on the internet, talking to a number of people about the value of pickleball courts, especially those that are, have national potential uh, uh, games, whatever you call those, uh, that national tournaments that would come to Mount Dora. Uh, I, I'm assuming that what Mr. Massey was saying, that that is going to be a significant economic driver for the city of Mount Dora, period. Uh, and there, to me, there is no more obvious place to put this park is next to another park. So it has continuity and consistency in its utilization. It just, you flow, it just a, it's just a nice flow. Uh, I can also see, for, and I'm speaking now as uh, the Northeast community, principally in my district, I can see a significant addition to small businesses supporting that whatever it may be. I mean, if, if I were a businessman living in that area or not living in that area, I'd want to invest in whatever it might be to support the folks that are going to come there. Uh, you know, various shops and little stores and things like that that are perfect community uh, additions that would support that because it's kind of an if you build it, they will come. I see that as happening with, with regard to those businesses. So I, I like... I like the idea, the conceptual concept is rough as, as, as Ms. Jewell has said, but it looks and, and makes sense to me. I have been in other parks like this in other cities where the baseball and other softball diamonds have been in a circular area. It makes strategic planning sense to me, best use of space, having a concession in that central area or nearby. Uh, it all seems to fit, and I'm anxious if this is uh, positive going forward to see a more skilled, not that this wasn't skilled, but it's a rough draft, I know, but to see more detail uh, that will enhance that, and there are people smarter than all of us here that do those things uh, in, a, in a good way. I think the neighbors in that community would... I believe, I'm guessing, but I believe their housing values would increase because of this. When you live to a park or a school, and you tell, I'm telling you, your property values go up. They always have, in my experience, legally and otherwise. So uh, I think that's a benefit to the community as well. So I, I support this concept, and I thank the staff for taking the time. I do want to see that grant application. We gained 200 grand today. Thank you very much, taxpayers, and uh, and I'm, and we are all one of them, uh, among them. So let's pursue that with aggression and get as much with aggressiveness and get as much as we can. Uh, hopefully, max out whatever we can, and that'll take marketing by by Amy and our city manager and those that do those things. Good marketing uh, and lobbying. So. I talked way too long, but I really support the concept uh, that's been discussed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Ms. Burnett, do you have any comments for us? Just a question. I want to know where the trail is going to be. Um, so, Amy, I'll let you cut over that, but the... So right now there's a, um, right in front of the um, Public Works de demolished property, there's the bike walking trail that cuts through there. So. Um, that carries all the way over. So there will be a trail that will connect this as well all the way over to Lake Franklin. So it will be all woven throughout the park if we get our way. But we've got the nice sidewalk in the front with a bike trail and then there'll be a, a walking trail that will connect with Lake Franklin as well. So then you'll be able for the neighborhood, it, uh, the Lake Franklin trailhead won't be accessible via parked car. It's more for that community for them to be able to walk and to get all the way kind of across town in a sense um, by trail. Okay. And then so. to Tremaine, obviously, there'll also be a trail from... Yeah, and, and I know they're working on some um, drawings too from throughout the Northeast community to connect all this. It's all very kind of 
um, pie in the sky right now, but I think it's all going to eventually come together really well. So, and one more question. So, how does Frank Brown fit in with this? The 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 park that's up there. Does it? Does it? Um, no, not really. No, Frank Brown is kind of a. It's it's quite a few several blocks away. <laughs> right. And so it doesn't. It wouldn't necessarily fit in with this unless we were going to use those fields from a tournament perspective to tie into the, the fields here and use those fields over there. Then it's all nicely put together to be able to um, house that. One of the things that's come out of the focus groups that we had about Lincoln Park was every single one was it's a it's a hidden jewel. It's a hidden jewel. It's 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 right there in the center of the community. And so many people didn't. So many of the focus groups, the dog park didn't even realize, you know, the elements of the park were there, the disc golf course, and the disc golfers didn't even realize the dog park was there because it's just missing an overall, like, you've arrived and this, you've arrived at your destination kind of feel. Right. And so that's what's kind of nice about this, too. It could help pull it all together. So I have one more question. Mm -hmm. So when you say the reduced size dog park, yes. what, what, do you, what do you mean about that? Um, it would, based on, so right now, I think it's really minimal. This is pretty well to scale. It's he he did a pretty good job of laying everything out. But see how the dog park has a kind of curve to the top of it. Right. It's really that's what it would probably be um, removing. Which I think there's enough there. I mean, again, this is totally a rough draft, and we would be sitting down with the dog park crowd, and would be sitting down with the baseball crowd, and everything before any of this was ever put into final final plan anyway. But. Um, I think if anything, our dog park is on the big side, um, and it needs it needs some TLC too. It needs some formalized pavilions and seating and, and things like that. And we are working. Amy's working with um, a lot of the participants of the dog park to better make better use of that dog park and the properties. So we are already having those meetings. I think you've already had at least one, correct? Yep. And we're we're doing small little improvements now adding them into the general budget, kind of little improvements here and there. A, a big piece is electric. We're going to need to get electric out there, but as we, you know, put this plan together, that's all going to come together, too, so. And I'd also like to mention the Grandview plan. The RMA Grandview plan really could tie into this, whatever we put there, um, because right now it's in place, but there's nothing there, so we haven't been able to expand upon that. So um, th maybe this will give us the, the real estate to, to really expand that Grandview plan and, and, and help those businesses along there and maybe even figure out, you know, what better businesses. Uh, if you remember the plan, it stated first floor would be a business and a second or third floor would be possibly residential. Um, again, additional homes in the area. Um, so I think that's something else that could be interwoven into this total project and, and plan. The pickleball courts also, I, I did put it in the memo, um, they would definitely be a uh, high priority for Lake County Tourism Grant Funds, but the grant we were just awarded, the Land uh, Water Conservation Fund, would also be looking very interested in this piece of property, whereas we can't necessarily apply for Lincoln Park as, as it currently sits because we've got a FERDAP grant out that is, we're probably going to get that. So, um, But it does look like uh, Pickleball would qualify for LWCF, which could either be our matching so that it matches our tourist grant, or it could be in, in addition to. So, Yes, sir. Mr. Massey. I was remiss in not telling, in terms of education, since many of you are not pickleballers, that uh, this is a sport that you can play with a minimal investment. You can buy a, an everyday paddle, composite or wooden, for about 50 bucks, and you can spend, if you're high end, all the way up to about 150. You can buy three uh, wiffle balls, which are the balls that you play with, about the size of a baseball, and holes bored in them so they're unpredictable in where they're going to go, uh, for 10 bucks. Uh, and aside a paddle and three wiffle balls, you need a good pair of tennis shoes and you're equipped to go. It's a sport that uh, is low cost to get into uh, and I think I can speak based on friendship with the folks that I play pickleball with that you would draw a lot of support from that community in terms of volunteer time and effort to help organize tournament. In that regard, I would ask you as a council to please consider, since this is a new and fresh start, a fresh look, 
don't piecemeal this project. Don't put in eight courts and then put eight courts some, and then later and later and later. Do it as a do it as a tournament style play from the outset, uh, and because you've got economies of scale in the uh, in the process and the engineering and and work. Uh, it's an exciting concept, and I'm so pleased that, uh, that it has presented itself at an appropriate time. Ms. Dahl? Um, do you know off the top of your head how, my, how much parking is out there right now? Oh, Amy, do you? I know we've, she's looked at all the parking. Um, not nearly enough. Um, I'm going to ballpark it at about 100 maybe behind, maybe a little more than that behind the pool, but, but it's, as far as paved parking, I would say it's even 60 or less, but then you've got the dirt parking. So parking has been an issue for the Babe Ruth fields. A lot of times um, they'll take their coolers out with their, their um, snacks for the kids and they don't have anywhere on concrete to roll it, you know, so parking has been an issue. Parking's been an issue for um, Ice House. It's been an issue for the dog park. It's an issue for the mountain bikers. So, yeah, so we're... So here in your plan, you've got 350, there. 200, and then we haven't identified the parking over by the 18 courts that you presented, which would be... There's 100, I believe. There's 100, 100 okay. there, and then there's some parking in front of the tennis courts, like 24 spots. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, the Tootsie Roll kind of area is about 200. And then we, we could also always look at, if necessary, shared parking with the Ice House, as well as with the school across the street. There's, there's options there, too, so... We'll get a national tournament. We'll need any space. We would. I was just going to... Chrissy's talking, so let me let her finish. Yes. Um, the area where the Tootsie Rolls are <laughs> is pretty hilly right now because that is grass parking, so, so that will be paved parking. Uh, I mean, I know this is all very... Yeah, I think it could be either. Okay. It's not... Um, that's pretty flat, actually, right through there. Um, this is moving into the pole yard area, which we haven't really discussed, but we would need to relocate our pole yard, which we're being hopeful about the new um, public works facility. I think the public works guys have stopped screaming every time I mention that, so I think they're feeling a little more positive about it. <laughs> Joe says no in the back. <laughs> Darn! <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm super supportive of this plan. Um, you know, as rough as it is sketched, I, I'm um, Again, this was never meant to be shared, so I just going to say it was... I begged her for this early, yeah. earlier, so it's just a good visual. It, it's a visual yeah. to give you a conceptual idea of what could be, and really the discussion is so that they can hear your thoughts, and then we really need to send them off because they've got the different committees to work with and everything, but at least they know that if we're supportive of it here, and plus the timing for the grant... Right. So it's, you know. No, it's great. I definitely support somewhere. it. And also, um, we just spoke last night at the Northeast Community Watch meeting about a, a community center that the Northeast can really, really use. So that would be a big... This is a 25... The, the reason they designed some of the parking this way is um, they dropped this in here. And I believe this plan actually goes back quite a ways. Um, it's a 25,000 square foot space, which is actually... Um, and from my past life, 25,000 square foot would be pretty usable for an inside gymnasium for, for pickup basketball and hoops. It would also be able to have probably a large multi-purpose room that could be broken down, down into two or three rooms. So if you wanted to offer group exercise or have a place for community groups to meet but you wanted to separate them out, you could still do that and have a kitchen area and probably a locker room and, and restrooms just in that area as well as potentially three or four offices in case you wanted to have a lifeguard housed out of there and a, a northeast community staff member or community police. Which yeah. area yeah. are we referring to with that comment? Which area? The, where it says community center down there above the park. Gotcha. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> and, and keep in mind we're renovating the pool right now. We're marsh siding and doing the filtration, which the filtration very well could be in an um, outside unit. The timing might be right in the sense that we don't need to renovate those locker rooms if we went if we move forward with a community center, maybe we just build those locker rooms and restrooms into the community center and then remove that sore eye anyway. So maybe a breezeway between or something so it's all appears connected even if it's not it's totally yeah. connected. Yeah. Great. I love it. Okay, Mr. Crail and then Mr. Tucker, you haven't had any comments yet, but Mr. Crail, you wanted to add something to what you said? Well, I, I thank you. I, I was just thinking a, a, a good model. If you haven't been over to Hickory Point uh, on, on uh, State Route 19, where the new bridge is being built, um, uh, 
two years ago, I think, the county tourism uh, dollars were used to make what I have heard is either the biggest or one of one the of biggest, biggest uh, sand volleyball complexes. Um, and uh, since then they've added um, lock, lock, not locker rooms, dressing rooms and training facilities and things like that. Um, and they have a lot of statistics in terms of what kinds of uh, volleyball players show up. Some are kids, some are adults. They all need a place to uh, stay. They buy <coughs> gas. They, they uh, uh, eat meals and, 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 and like to shop and all that sort of thing. Uh, um, and I, I, um, I think that's a great example that it has worked very locally. Thank you. Mr. Tucker. In full disclosure, I do not play pickleball. What? I'm not as old as you. <laughs> you get into I'll get there. You'll get into it next year. Next year. You should have never gone on the record with that. You're going to be recruiting for sure now. I know. No, but my sister plays pickleball. Younger my sister? Older. <laughs> uh, my bride has played pickleball. Uh, her girlfriends all try to recruit her to play pickleball. They all play pickleball. I'm an ardent supporter of pickleball. I even bought my sister a pickleball bag with her name on it for her, <laughs> whatever the racket's called. But anyway, I digress. If this, this looks pretty good. Uh, my concerns would be cost in the long run and uh, the Northeast. As long as the Northeast is on board with it and it's going to we see some benefits to it. I'm all for it, 100. percent This would tie in everything up there. And don't you dare ever. Your artwork is amazing. <laughs> this is not my artwork. Okay, this, this is actually for council discussion. Yeah. But Mr. Masterson, I will allow if it may keep it short. He tried to trip you? Um, Mr. Sandersville said, oh, that can't happen. So, um, <laughs> three-minute thing. I won't even sit down. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's on. It's just hang on. Okay. Mike Masterson, 7887 Crosswinds Way. I guess I'll approach it from a different way. I think it's the job of a city to provide a variety of, of support for its citizens, police and fire, roads, drinking water, etc. And there, your enthusiasm for this concept discourages me from the respect that what about when do we stop being an entertainment city and when do we provide support for our citizens? And I don't know in the five years I've been coming to these meetings that I've heard about a project that was totally focused on the lower 20% of income within the city of Mount Dora. This is an opportunity that seems to have gotten cast aside, worker housing. If you, listen, if you read the Orlando Sentinel and you see what's going on down around um, Disney, they're actively working to try to incorporate into the construction of all, any of the new parks worker housing. We have a lot of low-wage jobs in downtown waitering, Deck, uh, clerks, etc. And I wonder where those people live and how far they're commuting to work at these shops. And would we get perhaps a better quality worker if we had local housing as opposed to whatever? So I, I would ask that you take a look at what, are, what is the city offering to the, t the lower 20% of our city because 50 bucks. Fifty bucks for a, a paddle, and then you had sneakers, and, and then you got to have gloves, and some might need uh, masks, etc., uh, goggles, whatever. You're talking a fair amount of money that you might get invested in. So, I would think, say, before you get your enthusiasm going for this thing and running off because it might bring tourist dollars, think about how this city is supposed to serve the other part of this city. Okay. Because I'm, I'm a little discouraged that everybody got on this bandwagon. And I don't mean to be the conscience, but I just say, remember, there's other people in this city. That's all. Thank you. Thank you.
And actually, we really did talk, begin our discussion about affordable housing, and that's another whole piece that we're going to be dealing with. If not now, when? You've got, you've got. Four, We've been having discussions in the different, the um, committees, okay. and that's and actually, as I said earlier, um, Pastor Rowe, the gentleman from Miami, was here what two months ago. So yes, we we know that that's also very important. There's a balance of all the different things. I, I think that if you. Would you say we're going to advance both of these articles at the same degree of enthusiasm and momentum? I feel a little bit better, but it's, it seems because of the enthusiasm that that part. Good. Well, I, and, 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 and I guess I guess I, I, I hear what you're sure. saying, but I think part of when it comes to the affordable housing, we would like to hear back from the Northeast as to what because they've started that discussion already, okay. as did the community start in their community meetings. So hopefully that's going to get to the Northeast CRI and get back to us in the in the continuation of it because that is. I thank you for the thank you. The agenda. Yeah. Okay, so seems to me there's support in moving forward for them to look at this. And I think the most important thing, and I think you've all said it, is that we make sure you talk to all the entities that need to be a part of it as you try to pull it all together. Uh, we recognize there is a timing element. Um, I guess my opinion is, yes, we do want grants, but those grants sit out there. We've never really gone after grants from the county to any huge level that I can remember because I sat on that committee for several years and kept wondering when Mount Dora was going to be there for some of the money they were giving away to Claremont and to, uh, to other places, right? So, you know, there, there are cycles to it, so it would be nice to be able to hit that, but if it in any way, in my opinion, infringes on our ability to do good planning, then maybe it's not this cycle, but the next. And again, I'm just saying that in a bigger picture, you all have to do the determination because we depend on your, uh, it's your staff that's going to pull it all together as we have the side-by-side -side discussions going um, also about the other components since that no affordable housing was one of the things everybody thought. I feel very similar to what's already been expressed. I would like to see the infill and, and be able to identify however many sites we can so that they become part of the community rather than having what, whether we like it or not, the social stigma of feeling like it's tenement housing or low income housing. It, 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 it's affordable housing and it fits into the community and with the number of what appears to be some lots we could work with, I would also like to see that if the Northeast is agreeable to it, to get that moving too. So that's part of the agenda. Okay. And we'll be moving forward with right. that. Uh, yes, we'll be moving forward then. Thank you for doing this so quickly. Okay, so departmental update for November, I believe we're at. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so the report's in there. If you need that, um, I would encourage you to read through it. Um, good information from our lobbyists. Um, and let me pass on some quick information. Uh, John Wayne Smith, who is our representative from uh, uh, People Smith and Matthews. Um, John has had uh, suffered a stroke recently. Um, had to be cauterized. Um, he is up and walking and moving, but he's not working right now. Ryan Matthews, the other partner, one of the other partners, has reached out reached out to me to explain to me the status um, and to just keep us an update and keep us in the loop. What you'll notice in the e, in the package is emails from Angela, another member of their group. Um, again, giving us great information. Um, just again for the public, it said that um, let us know that the city's Brit Road Utility Extension Project. Uh, House Bill 3593 is on the agenda in the House Agricultural and Natural Resource Appropriations Subcommittee. Um, and then she further, to, further uh, another day further told me that uh, just an update um, to keep us in the loop of the information. Um, and I think there's probably one more email that says um, the House Bill 3593 passed the House AG and uh, Natural Resource uh, Subcommittee yesterday with no opposition. So again, so these are appropriations. These are monies that we're not going after on a grant. These are appropriations from the state. Um, that, and I don't know the exact dollar amount for Brit Road. Two half million. Half million. Okay, half million. So again, it's funding that we don't need to come up with. It's funding that will be provided to the city to, to go forth and again, Wolf Branch. So we're very excited about that. Um, and I think... Let me get back to the agenda. I apologize. Oh, Chet. Okay. So construction. So come on up, Chet, and let's uh, go through our. Um... 
trying to find the construction project updates. Well, good evening. Uh, we'll do a quick update as we have in the past on a few of the current projects. Um, at the 5th and Baker dumpster enclosure, this is the last one to uh, get into operation. Um, Public Works has worked on the site for corrections uh, to access the compactors and also to uh, <coughs> parking spaces, which was successful. Uh, we are currently still working with waste management on the kinks on the last of uh, the trash uh, dumpsters, the recycle, or excuse me, compactor. The recycle compactor is operational. Um, and we're meeting actually this week with waste management to uh, solve the issues with the last one. So and it's a leveling issue? Yes, it is. Um, we hope to solve it with adjustment of the machine itself, not have to get into any of the, the parking lot, the paving. Um, so we're working with them. Uh, we, we experienced the same issues at 4th and Alexander. It's really a learning curve, so uh, we'll get through it within the next few weeks, hopefully. And, uh, and the temporary dumpsters will be out of there. So those are just in place to, to handle the load right now. Um, as you discussed, just discussed, the, uh, the Highland demolition is complete. Uh, we just had a few pictures here this weekend. It was actually hydro seeded. And um, I was out there just before this, the council meeting, and uh, they were moving the last of the temporary fence that was the... Uh, keep the public out of there. Uh, Publix, I don't have a picture in this, but Public Works did um, install a fence around our fuel tank that's left uh, to secure that. Just It's not operational, um, but just to for the security of it. Um, so that, that area is seated and with this rain and, and the contractor watching it. We'll have grass there before we know it. So can you kind of give the council a quick, I know we talked about um, how long the contractor will be on board until this is green grass versus just so, spray. So he has a 30 day, um, of course they keep a, a watchful eye on the weather. With this hydro seeding, it's, it's a very successful process, especially with the weather we're having now. If it, dry, <laughs> if it, dri <laughs> if it dries out, um, he will be responsible to, to water it and to ensure that it, it, it does take Take seed. Thank you. Uh, the the land clearing is the, the last project that um that is a hundred percent complete. Uh, the seeding process there was more of a traditional seeding uh, due to the size and and what we'll eventually do uh, with the with the land. Um, so that actually I've visited that this week and uh, with this rain it, it's actually sprouting too. So. Um, a good success there. The last uh, item we'll speak to is the third and banker parking lot. Um, the positives there are that uh, last week and, and completed this week, Public Works uh, replaced some of the sidewalks uh, in front of the lot that were just old and, and cracked and damaged. Um, we've we've got a few of the other. Of the historical plaque installed and the bench and, and trash can and things of those nature um, for the upcoming restroom and um, we actually have CPH here tonight with us um, to discuss kind of the measures going forward uh, we've investigated it with the, with the engineer with the contractor that actually performed the work um, there was a step that was misinstalled an, an underlayment of fabric. Uh, we've we've spoke to the contractor about that. I have, and we have communication. Um, they've acknowledged that, and they are they are going to fix that at at no cost to the city. Um, so that that will take time. We plan on doing this remediation work uh, sometime in the spring after our events, keeping those in mind. Um, and I could let if Scott or Ben wanted to to say anything as far as the engineering aspect of it. Good evening, Scott Brighton Slam with uh, CPH. I also have Ben Buencamino, who's the project manager, been working with Chet on this. Um, yes, we're committed to making sure we get this problem uh, taken care of. Uh, we're working on a detail that we'll, we'll work with uh, the contractor in the city to help uh, 
once they go in and, and install it the correct way, uh, it will be able to uh, get appropriate seating uh, to take the place of the sod that was put before. Uh, ben had reached out to the manufacturer of the GeoGrid and uh, uh, basically discussed uh, you know, the levels of traffic going through there. Uh, and that was the manufacturer's of the uh, product uh, a recommendation is probably moving forward with a, a seed approach and let it establish a root zone. Uh, versus the grass, correct? Versus the grass, correct. Very good. So we will close down once we, I think from from the discussion earlier, um, once we're through season, close the park down. They'll come in and correct it, clean it up, reseed yes, it. Mm -hmm. Yes, by the time uh, we'll have worked with the city and the contractor to develop an approach to get this done correctly. And so that once the events are done, the contractor will come back out, uh, pull out the, the uh, basically it was the membrane fabric that for the gravel underneath, uh, they, didn't, they didn't install it correctly. So uh, I don't know if that was necessarily the, the total problem, but uh, once it, uh, we get involved with it, we'll get it, get it straightened up for, for us to have a... A parking lot and at no cost of the city all of this correct. is covered under the contractor um, and CPH yes. to correct the the drawings and go forward and to show that is we're already working on the drawings so. so we'll just have a little bit more time um, in the meantime I think Chad has said that they'll continue to go out there and like right now we have some mud right and they're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays trying to let it yes correct. Okay. and it will probably be closed tomorrow with this rain today okay Otherwise, it will probably be under. Um, but uh, through Chet's uh, investigation of continuing to look, and I know all of you have expressed your concern for the parking lot, um, and, and re he reached out to CPH, and again, coming back to the decision and the conclusion on Friday and today, or Monday, today's Tuesday, Friday and Monday, that we had a little more of an issue underneath than it was originally uh, thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mayor. Uh, could I, Chet, could I ask one question? Yes. Could we go back to the uh, limit uh, property that's being leveled? Yeah. There's a swale in about in the middle of that. Uh, how is that going to, is it going to be some piping or is it going to be covered up? It's a drainage uh, area. Oh, yeah. That was just the natural lay of the land. So okay. uh, when they cleared all the tree and the, the grub, we degrubbed. Um, Basically, their direction, or, or actually in their contract, was just to restore the land back to its natural drainage. So we don't want to change anything at this point. Sure. That'll come with the uh, most likely the public works complex. Sure, but the any, site plan. any facility that's built will take that into consideration. Yes. Sure. yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to add one thing. Okay, Joe has something to add. I just want to add one thing. The uh, fuel depot is mothballed at the moment but if we need it we can use it in a heartbeat so that right. we left it there for a reason just in case there was an emergency and that will, it, it can easily be relocated if we do pick a ball before it's or anything else all right thank you thank you thank you um, so uh, just for council's uh, understanding um, CPH has slept out slipped out but I really wanted them to step up and uh, so you would understand that they did stick up to their part of the deal as well as the contractor when Chet reached out to him last week contractor had no problem we just don't have anything in writing so I said they need to come before you said in the public it's a public record at that point in time and they're accountable so that you would all know at the same time where we stood with that project that's part of their contract anyway it, it is but again it was realization that there was some um, you know, the way it was written was contradictory on a couple of the plans, and they needed to acknowledge that on their side. Yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, we have board appointments. Um, the Lake County Library Advisory Board appointment. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, sorry. If I can get this to work. So we have a council to appoint Steve Berger and alternate uh, Robert Harris Turner to the Lake County Library Advisory Board, um, if that is your desire. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. You have a library roster in front of you also that just gives you the uh, members that you have appointed to the board at this point in time. Okay. Speaking of appointments, uh, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, all of my appointees to the seven or s seven advisory boards uh, are all up 
a year from now. And so I don't have any, I don't intend to replace anybody during okay. that period of time. I, I'm going to go through each of the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through, yeah, I'm going to go through each of the committees and see who's appointing whom or if you're re-upping them, um, because there's, there's quite a few that need to be done. So I think that if everybody's all right with that. I think that'll be the easiest way to do it by committee when we get there. Okay. Uh, so then, next, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. sorry, then we have the Lake Sumter MPO Governing Board, um, and I would recommend Kathy uh, Host, the Mayor of City of Mount Dora, to serve on that Lake Sumter MPO Governing Board um, if this is the desire of the council. Sorry. Second, second. <laughs> all, all in favor? Penalty position. And we, the alternate is Mr. Crow. Are you going to stay with that as an alternate? Okay. Thank you. Okay, very good. We I would include that in your motion. Amend it with such. Thank you. Everybody in agreement? Okay. Okay, now we have the advisory board appointments. Um, I actually have the sheets that you all gave out. That's all right. That's all right. Um, and then these are just in the order they happen to be in my stack. I have the Historic Preservation Board, um, Debt Jokes. I'm going to reappoint um, uh, District 1. Mr. Cutshaw's finished. Is he going to be reappointed? Yes, he is. Okay, um, that one, that one. Um, District 4, Carl Anderson. Uh, Carl Anderson has asked to um, resign. Okay. Uh, his schedule has changed and I'm recommending Philip Crutwell. Okay. Okay. City Clerk, do you have the application for the, Philip? Should be in the packet. Thank you. Okay, and. Um, you want a motion on that or collective? I was going to do collective. That's fine. That's all right. Um, uh, at large, odd. Uh, Sharon Nichols is. Um... She's agreed. And I will reappoint. Okay, so uh, I'll entertain a motion then to reappoint all the ones that have been designated and add the additional um, person from uh, <coughs> District 4. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, Parks and Rec Committee. Um, I will reappoint Amy uh, Fortenberry. She wants to stay. Um, District 1. District <coughs> 1. Wendy Appleby has agreed, and Carrie Mullen um, will stay on for a few more weeks, and then Wendy Appleby will take over. Okay, so when is Wendy Appleby <coughs> taking over? We, we need a date because... So I think, well, let's say January 1st. January 1st. So in other words, Miss Mullen will complete her term yes, January thirty first. Yes. And then you're recommending then Wendy Appleby. Okay. And, and Mayor, have... all the dates are really effective in January, so right. according to their meeting date. So all would be uh, at that point in time and not in December at this point. Right. Correct. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, District four, Robert Moore. Uh, Robert Moore has, I talked with Robert and he has asked to resign from the board and uh, I've been working with Troy. We've got some he has some ideas, so I don't okay. I'm not ready on that, but I should be and, and with Sunshine then I will tell you I did get a call tonight from someone who's very active with the um, biking, the AMBA. And they may have a recommendation of someone who lives here in town who might be interested also. But I don't know if we have an application yet. Troy supports well, like that. Troy supports. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So that's great. And I assume okay. that person has or will. Well, I don't know. I just I took the call from um, okay. a friend, and he just wanted to know if there's an opening. And I said I wouldn't know until I sat up here tonight. There is. So, so that's great. Okay. So, so and Amy, it might be the name you have. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't. He has the flu right now. I think he's planning on. Yeah, That's the person. He, he never told me the name. He just told yeah. me he had the flu and couldn't be. <laughs> I be think we're all in sync I'd here. I'd be happy to talk with whoever. So we, we can do that appointment in January. By phone. Once. I'm not going to go there if he's good. No, he's got the flu. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, will you send over the yes. name to the city clerk so yes. that she has that? Okay. And then um, at large, odd. Uh, Ken Crawley has asked to uh, step down at the end of his term. Uh, and I thank him for his service, and I'm appointing or nominating Austin Gunther to serve in his place, and he has an application on the file. Okay. And um, alternate member at large. Oh, that's mine. I haven't seen Tom when he's had the family thing, so, so let's me, wait. we'll wait until January for that one. Uh, and then um, District 1 alternate member. District 1, Parks and Recreation. Mm -hmm. Wendy, I will be. Yes, is she going to remain? 
She's gonna. She's moving up to be the district. Oh, okay. I now I didn't up. understand what you were saying. So you still then have an opening down here. Right. It's going to be your alternate then. I don't know. Okay, so you still need someone also. Okay, that's fine. Um, so I'll take a motion for the ones that we've talked about. We have two that will need to come back then. The alternate and then my alternate for this mayor. And I'm sorry, three. And then yours. So we have three. So we have... I move approval. Okay. Second. Okay. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, the Northeast CRA. I'm reappointing, reappointing Rona Rowe. Um, District 1? District 1. Um, Darius Strong. And he has an applicant on file? I think he does. I don't know. We could approve subject to that. Subject to that. Okay. If the, uh, if the application's not in the packet, we don't have it yet. Okay. So we could just ask him. Oh, I'll now. ask him. Reach out to him. I'll ask him. Okay. Um, Steve Harley, District 4. Um, I've spoken uh, to Steve and we're good to go. Stay on board. Okay. And um, at large, uh, Janet mentioned. I spoke with Ms. Mencham. She is willing to serve another term and has been active on the board. Uh, mm -hmm. yes, she is. And uh, I'm going to nominate her. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion then to. Um, Accept all the reappointments. I so move subject to the one that uh, the application in for Darius. Second. Uh, being finalized. Thank okay. You. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. <coughs> Library roster. Let's see. Um, Steve Berger will be reappointed. I've talked to him. Let's see. Pam, <laughs> District 1. District 1. It was me, and yeah, so I don't, Helen Cutshaw has agreed, and I do not have an and alternate. she was the yet. alternate, okay. Yes, and I will work on that. Okay. And District 4? I've, I've spoken with Susan Myers, and um, she's been very active and would like to stay, and uh, that's great. Okay, and at large, odd, John Stewart? John Stewart, uh, I've talked with him at length. He's uh, very interested in continuing be reappointed in that show. Okay. And um, I will be reappointing um, Robert Turner, Harris Turner, as the alternate. And then you'll, um, Ms. Burnett, get one on. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion to accept the reappointments. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, CRA Advisory Committee, I'm reappointing Oktar Hussein, um, District 1. District 1. I am reappointing Glenna Birch. Uh, she, was a she had been recently placed on there because of um, a change. So right. maybe the last two meetings. She was. Do I recall that? Yes. I believe us. October, November, and December. Oh, I'm sorry. Planning. I'm um, yes. What did you say? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm at CRA Advisory Committee. Okay. Sorry. Oh. I was on the planning myself. I'm doing CRA Advisory. CRA. <laughs> Nancy Ballison? Oh, yes. Nancy is going to re reappoint. Thank you. Okay, very good. Sorry about that. And uh, District 4, David Byrne? Uh, David is very interested in uh, staying, and that's great. Okay, and at large odd, Joe Gillespie? Joe has agreed to serve another term, and I so forth. Okay, do I have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, Public Arts Commission? Um, I'm reappointing Tom Decker, uh, District 1. John Wesner. Reappointing, okay. Uh, Mary Ann McNamara, District 4. Yes, she's uh, good to go, and I would support her reappointment. Yes. Okay, and at large, Harlow Mill. And uh, I reappoint Harlow, uh, he says he has no other <coughs> name. Okay, good. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion for all the reappointments of the. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, planning and zoning. I'm reappointing John Cataldo. Uh, you're uh, reappointing Glenna Birch. Yes, I am. That's the one. Okay, and um, District 4? I'm reappointing Mike McGuire, who would like to continue. Okay, and then at large odd, Doug Brandt. Reappointing. Okay, so I have all reappointments. Um, I'll entertain a motion. So 
Second. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, so that takes care of all of the appointments, but the ones we have to come back and do. So with that, City Attorney Report. Yes, ma'am. Um, we actually have no new claims, which is good news. So, um, I have nothing to report there. I don't even want to make anything up for you. So, um, thank you. The next item on the agenda that I have to discuss with you is the Bradner property update. You'll recall um, two meetings ago, we signed the real property purchase agreement to purchase the Bradner property, and we were in the process of getting uh, an appraisal report. The uh, appraisal report did not get finalized within the time period that we had, the 20 days. And so we have asked Mr. and Mrs. Bradner if they were willing to sign an extension. The timing for them to agree to sign the extension was after this agenda went out to you all, so I could not get a, a document together to get on the agenda. But what I'm requesting at this point, they have put it in writing that they're willing to extend the time period for our due diligence to the 23rd of December. So I'm asking that you all direct myself to draft the appropriate amendment, which just simply amends the due diligence period through and including December 23rd to enable us to finalize the appraisal process. And we'll go ahead. Um, and I'd just like to add to that, if I may. So um, through this process, part of this uh, conversation that we've had over the last couple of weeks that have been that's been addressed is the fact um, as to whether our appraiser can truly um, appraise. Um, so Ed Barfield represents the city in negotiating purchases in right of way and acquisition of property. He is a state certified appraiser. Um, our RFP that he is working under actually qualifies him to, was bid as a right-of-way acquisition and a property um, negotiation, not as a state appraiser, not as an appraisal services. So um, he submitted a proposal that he would like to offer those other services as well as appraisal services, um, and our uh, prior legal accepted that proposal, and, and, and there was a lost bit of um, assumption and, and, and uh, really communication is the best way I can say that he really should not have been appraising. Now, we have not used him as an appraiser except for the limit and this property we had brought to you a consideration for that. Um, uh, Tim Wilson's gone out and he's went through three quotes, has a qualified appraiser for this one and that person is a local um, uh, company. Um, um, Mr. Barfield did negotiate the purchase of the Gobi property. Um, he did go out and uh, request two um, quotes and had two appraisers from other companies because he negotiated. He was in conflict with actually providing us the appraisal. Those were $4,500 and $4,900 for those two. Um, so uh, the long and short of it is we have to go out with a new RFP for appraisal services and we'll ask that those be uh, restricted on giving us a dollar amount in there so that we control that and it's not a bidding more on what that might be. Um, and that we use Mr. Barfield for his services that he was uh, that he replied to as as far as an RFP and only uh, right away acquisitions and negotiation of properties and that type of thing and keep the, the two very separate. Um, he does have a, an obligation as a state license holder to give us correct information. It could be revoked otherwise and uh, those of us who have a license, we know how that works. So I don't believe we have an issue there but we don't want to put ourselves nor him in that position. So um, through this the discussion at the last meeting we've found all these things out. We appreciate that information. Um, I will tell you the bids or the quotes do range from twenty-five to forty-five hundred. So I don't think there is a set amount for a quote. I will tell you that Mr. Barfield's quote was based on his hourly salary that was or hourly bid um, of wage or or. or Rate, thank you, is rate at the number of hours that he thought it would take to do the appraisal, which was how he hit the 5000 um, When you're paying for a project uh, for appraisal, that could come in at 2500 but I guess it could come in at five two. 
but this way we get a bid for each individual project going forward versus a flat rate, well, then it will always take you 20 hours or whatever it might be. So it's been an um, educating and enlightening experience, um, and we will have also reached out to him to let him know that his proposal um, of his services really has to match the RFP that we put out. Um, and uh, we put a note in the record of that prior acceptance of that um, with our prior legal back in 2018. I think so, that's all I have. So the summary is we've now aligned everything the way it needs to be aligned with what they're, they're qualified to do, and there isn't a crossover. That's correct. And we'll bid the RFP for appraisal services, but we have three quotes at this time. Actually, Tim went out for four quotes because he had a non-responsive. Um, so we'll get quotes in the meantime, um, but we have separated the two to make sure that there's not a crossing. And really, that was the city attorney's um, comments in the past, is that he's not our appraiser. He was a state-approved, state-certified appraiser, but not under the RFP, our appraisal services. So to better qualify that. Anybody have? Okay, yeah. I do have a comment. Uh, always the question comes up uh, from, usually from the audience, because I think we have a better understanding of the way this works frequently. But uh, did you have the property appraised? And we say, no, we evaluated it in terms of negotiation. And my understanding is we'll continue to do that. We don't want an appraisal when we go to negotiate. Correct. That right? is correct. And, That's and, Barfield's. And, and our audience never understands that. But as long as we say, We've had a property evaluation, we've begun negotiations, this is the price that we have proposed and they have tentatively accepted, and now we'll get the appraisal, and if the appraisal doesn't come in at our negotiated price, we walk. That's correct. We have the option to walk. Yes, correct. Okay, well, as long as everybody understands that's the way it works. That is we'll, correct. We'll probably have to re-educate the public every time we do it, but, but I, I'm glad now we have a separate and true process. And a, a couple other additional things have come out of this process. We we know also now that it's probably a better practice for us to increase our due diligence time period. Um, we don't want to strap ourselves. We want to give ourselves the time that we need. Um, so we are going to make sure that we do that moving forward. And this is also, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, but this is also why I do not like to attach every document to a just a little four-page agreement and then attach every document that the responder gets to us because rather than going through and pulling out what the scope of services was from the RFP that we did, we accepted everything that was given to us and we, we need to, and, and we've got better people in place looking at that now also, so that won't happen again. And that's really when I said earlier that's what our prior uh, legal had really had put in place, that's what they did. So once it was attached and part of the document and part of the file, it became part of the file each time and created that um, challenge for us. Yes, sir. And as a part of that, based on your comments, uh, Ms. Upton, uh, if you would like a motion, I'd like to do that. We all are involved in the Christmas season. We know how time has caught up with and our short suspense. Uh, I'd like to um, move that we adopt the philosophy that you have in extending our due diligence deadline to 23 December. Thank you. Second the motion. Okay. Any discussion? I, I, was I on the record with the second? Okay. Um, well, I, I'm glad it was brought up, mm -hmm. and, and I think this is a, a, a really good um, fix, I guess would be the way to say it. And, and I, you know, so. Very good. Good All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Um, any other business? Then we'll go into reports because we do have to do a, C a, a Northeast CRA also next. Okay. Ms. Burnett. Thank you. Oh, you can hear me. <laughs> yeah. So I, my comment is that we do need to do something about the turning lanes at Donnelly and 441. So there, so we need to do something about the painting of those lanes at the very, so there, do you know what I'm talking about? I do, and that is a county road that, that goes no, on to I know, us, I know, but Donnelly state. isn't, right? Sorry. No, that's a county road. And it goes on to uh, State, State Road. State so Road. Donnelly up in that area and, and 
Joe, you and, and Robert can correct me. Is Joe still here? But I believe it is a county road up in that area. Is it? Yeah. I'm sorry, I was in another conversation with the Donnelly up at 441. Is that not a county road? It's, once it's for, um, the intersection, it's the a county road. The intersection is county. It's, oh, okay. Yes. So, so, again, we can reach out. We can reach the county. It's city and county, right? No, no. It, it, county it's and county. city. The oh. intersection, uh, the, the right of ways along there are, are it, 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 that particular one is county and, and state. state. County and state. Okay. We can reach out to the county and ask that they consider it, but I will tell you, because the 441 at that intersection going forward will be improved um, in the next few years, they're going to give us a lot of pushback. Again, they do acknowledge it is the uh, the busiest intersection and the most accidents. And but we can reach out to the, George. I think is the guy that there are Robert plans work with. To, to do some expansion in there. Oh, yeah. on, on, the, on that road. Well, so the turning lane to go to the right. Yes. It's it's the paint is gone. Okay. Basically, we'll reach out. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask uh, Chief Bell. will reach out to George with the um, right. um, county and just see what they can do for us. Damn, that's uh, right, right in front of McDonald's. Yes. Right, right, right in front of McDonald's. Yes. It's it's not yes. good. It's really faded. Okay, and that's all. I can do that. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Olson. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, just a couple of things, a reminder of the 9 a.m. Monday beginning on the 13th, I think it is January, telephone calls uh, to call in for updates on uh, pending legislation. Uh, these are moving targets and every week they change. So if you have the time and, are, and have the interest, uh, just call in. I think uh, Ms. Hayes -Wolf Miller has sent the number and the code to call in. Uh, again, this is just a listening thing, but it really helps educate, and there are urgent calls at each time to please contact your local legislators to vote yes or no or whatever, and that really helps those legislators listen to people and constituents. Uh, so just for what it's worth, I wanted to remind everybody of that, how important at least the Lake League of Cities and the Florida League of Cities uh, considers that. Uh, congratulations to Ms. Hayes and Joe G and, her, and the staff for the successful Apopka St. John's Mount Dora Interconnect. <clears throat> Those of us that were there, it was a, a good time and, and a, a, a great example of intra or intercity sharing of issues that will help Mount Dora and will help Apopka and will be a mutual. Uh, mutual benefit to everybody and especially the citizens that might need that blood water connection. So uh, I was pleased to be there as, as well as others. Um, I want to thank each council member, the last, <coughs> this, last council member this year, uh, for your uh, good listening to my ranting, uh, your good uh, uh, impassioned comments during 2019. Uh, they all have helped me, and uh, uh, I have the deepest respect for each one of your <coughs> positions, your your comments, and uh, respect you sharing your views. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Hayes uh, and our city clerk, and Gwen, for all the administrative staff for their uh, superb tolerance and support to me over this year. Uh, I, I don't mean to self-deprecate, but uh, that administrative staff is very, very attentive to us as council members, and I certainly speak for myself that I feel good about the help that they provide. Um, even those little pieces of chocolate sometimes that I steal are very helpful to straighten me out. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank our city attorney and her firm for their legal skill, and I believe we are fortunate to have you and your guidance is valued. So from my standpoint, please convey that to the rest of your firm. Uh, I appreciate their skill sets and, and broad skill sets to help us out. And I, I suppose mostly I want to thank the regulars that come here and, and listen. That We heard them today. Uh, certainly they show up at council meetings, they write helpful ideas. Uh, we work for all of you and them, um, but and their helpful, their guidance is always helpful. 
I read them all. I listen to them. I don't always say yes or no when I, they want me to, but uh, I certainly value that comments. And uh, I thank our mayor for being tolerant of, and flexible for those that come here and want to express their view. That's very important that we do that. Uh, we don't always hear what we want to hear. Maybe tonight was an example, but uh, it's still valuable to do that. Um, I often don't dialogue, and most of the time I seldom dialogue with emails and comments on the street. I just listen, and I do that for a purpose because when I come to this council meeting, I try to listen to each one of your comments if you make them and give them consideration. I think it's unfair for me to commit to something fully uh, without keeping an open mind because you all help, help me make that decision. So I do uh, solicit your comments. And finally, um, <coughs> Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and Happy Holidays to everyone here, to all of you, and thank you for the honor of serving in 2019. Thank you. Mr. Tucker. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Mayor. Uh, first off, with the, I want to thank everyone on council and the audience that was at the Children's Library dedication a week and a half ago. Uh, it was tremendous. Thank you for the turnout. Uh, Kathy's not here tonight, but kudos to Kathy and her staff for doing all that. That's just tremendous. And again, anytime you have a little one, take them up there and let them go through that large children's library. Uh, I want to thank the police department for the invitation to go to uh, shop with a cop on Saturday. That was interesting. <laughs> Had a lot of fun. I mean, it's a uh, Next year, if you have the time during the holidays, do it. It's, it's watching the little ones shop is really fun. And you also see them sometimes thinking about their siblings or their parents and buying something. And then one little guy I was with, uh, he'd gone there the day before and with his mom and hidden things. So he knew right where to go to get what he wanted. <laughs> Which I thought was an uh, enterprising young man, yes. And, uh, so, uh, on the city council that are, yeah, he might be of higher aspirations, I think. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was really enjoyable, so I thank you. And I'll be very brief. Just want to uh, thank everyone and hope everyone here and everyone in the audience have a wonderful Christmas season and just a safe and happy 2020 uh, when we see you all again. And I uh, thank you all for putting up with my rantings at times for the past year. So again, everyone in council, I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas and uh, enjoy it with your families. Have a safe New Year. Thank you. I will pass. Mr. Craig. Um, Merry Christmas. Thank you. Vice Mayor Massey. Uh, I missed the Apopka Mount Dora Interconnect ceremony, but I had another task. I went to breakfast at the Daytona Speedway uh, as a guest of Advent Health. Uh, it was a tough job, but uh, somebody had to go do it. Uh, I do want to bring back news from that. I, I established a good personal rapport with the CEO from Advent Health uh, Waterman uh, and can tell you that very early in January we'll be a part of a ribbon cutting uh, for the facility just outside of Country Club. They are uh, they're, uh, looking forward to getting that done. Uh, and as soon as that's done, they're looking at uh, starting the second phase, which is the second level in that building, uh, and it has really turned out nicely. Uh, in closing, I'll say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you. Happy Hanukkah. I look forward to serving with you all again in the new year. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so I have a couple of things. Um, number one, I like to share, so um, you will have a key available to you upstairs in the offices, so if anybody needs to use the mayor's office for a meeting, I'm here on Mondays and Wednesdays in the morning, and any other time, I know there's times when you want to meet with people and you're trying to find a space, so they'll have a key upstairs. There is nothing in there that's private for me, so I hope you uh, take advantage of it and use that. I have an assignment for everyone. We're going to be doing a strategic planning session come January, um, uh, the 17th, I believe. Um, and I'd like you to be, I and mean, we go into the meeting, and it'll all be, you know, facilitate and everything, but I'd like you to be thinking ahead of what your three top priorities are 
as we go into that. Um, nothing formal, I just want to be thinking ahead, and, and uh, the city manager and I talked about that. Also, the state of the city, um, you know, our fiscal year actually ends September 30th, so uh, my goal is to have the state of the city uh, document completed by the 31st of March. Um, so um, it's just an information. We're going to be gathering the different pictures from the year, the different projects. If you have particular things you want us to be sure to highlight, just kind of send it to Ms. Hayes, and she'll get it as uh, Lisa and I work on it. Um, and then just some little known facts, you know, we had the wonderful Christmas parade. Uh, 1,500 pounds of food was collected for Lake Harris Food Pantry in $1,200, which I thought was wonderful. Then we went to Snowden the Park and we had 2,016 pounds of food collected. So both of them were very, very supportive of the food pantry and we're very appreciative of that. Um, and with that, I wish everybody happy holidays. And I'll entertain a motion um, for adjournment so we can go into the Northeast meeting. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. We're adjourned. Okay. Call to order. The Northeast Community Re Team. Uh We have four items for discussion. Uh, first one is resolution number 2019-185, community event and program sponsorship application for the Afro-American History Festival. Ms. Stuffin. Resolution number 2019-185 of the Northeast CRA, a resolution of the Northeast Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to the grant sponsorship program for the 2020 African American History Festival, providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for grant approval, providing authority for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for scrivener's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Ms. Hayes. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. So Adam Sudner, our CRA coordinator for the Northeast, is here to give you a summary of the um, event. Um, also, please make sure we include the date of the event, Adam, um, and just some, uh, some general information, if you will, please, sir. And I see that Cedric is also here. Um, and Cedric is the um, requester or the applicant, in this case, um, requesting the event. I apologize. The one fact I didn't have in my head was the date of the event. February 8th. Thank you. Uh, so the event is scheduled for February 8th. Um, this will be the 11th year now? 11th year of the event. Um, and we took this to the uh, Northeast Area Advisory Committee on the November 12th, and it will receive the 7 0 vote in support providing the funding um, per the application amount that's in the package of $15,500. Um, $15, um, we funded this event previously, um, and uh, Cedric's here to answer any of your questions. A bit short for you this evening. So. It's a budget or not? Yes, ma'am. I move approval of 185. Second. Um, anybody from the audience have any? Okay. Roll call, please. Mr. Robson? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Crail? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Ms. Burknett? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mayor Hope? Yes. Resolution number 2019-188, the grant agreement for Habitat for Humanity. Ms. Stubbin. Resolution number 2019-188, Northeast CRA, a resolution of the Northeast Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to the grant for affordable housing with Habitat for Humanity of Lake Sumter, Florida, Incorporated, providing for legislative findings and intent providing for approval of grant agreement and authorization to execute, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for Scribner's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Again, um, Adam Sumner is here, and um, Adam will give you a, a brief update on the purpose uh, in spending the $25,000 that's been requested of the city. Um, it is um, for the Habitat for Humanity uh, at uh, 602 East Jackson, and he'll give you a little bit of information for that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Um, Habitat for Humanity has owned this property since 2008 when they demoed a previously dilapidated structure that was deemed unsafe and uninhabitable at that point. Um, they're currently working through the process with the Mount Thor resident to be qualified to move into this home. 
They had a resident qualified, unfortunately he passed away. So they're working through with his spouse now to get them qualified to move into this home when it's approved. Um, the good news because there was an existing home, their sewer connection fees won't be as high. So we will not max out the full $25,000 total grant amount. Um, until they submit the final building plans with the total building cost, we don't know the exact number, but that's why we wrote the grant up to $25,000, which is the way this grant's normally um, approved. Right. So um, with that, gladly answer any questions I can. I do apologize on behalf of the Habitat staff. They were double booked this evening. Um, their president and CEO serves on the Utility Council, so he couldn't be here as they had a meeting this evening. He wanted to send his regards. Thank you. Was the CRA vote was what? Yes, sir. I apologize. They did. 6-0. Um, it was approved on October 8th. I move approval of 188. Second. Okay. My process is discussed first. I'm sorry. First. I'm sorry. Then we will have my problems. Okay. So <laughs> we'll go ahead now because I'm sure it's not, but I'm trying to break you into a new process. Okay. Um, any discussion? May I make my motion? No, you already made your motion. Oh, um, so I, will, we'll I want to say how delighted I am that uh, Habitat for Humanity is in Mount Dora yes, ready to turn dirt. I ready to go again. Yes. Anyone in the audience? Okay, back to council roll call. That's all right. Mr. Rolfson? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Crail? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mayor Hope? Yes. Resolution number 2019-189, Home Security Program. Ms. Stuffin? Number 2019-189, Northeast CRA. The resolution of the Northeast CRA, the Northeast Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to the creation of the Home Security Program, providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for adoption of the Home Security Program policy, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for scrutiners errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Mayor, Council Members, um, Adam Sumner again will come up and provide you some uh, information. Again, this was a great program, $30,000, um, and he brought props tonight to show you how we're spending that $30,000. Um, and I'd like for him just to, as part of his uh, presentation, to give you a little bit of the uh, background and the qualification of being able to um, apply for one of these um, um, units, I guess is the best way of looking at yes, them. So please, That's thank it. you. Um, so a little background, this program was actually conceived by my predecessor, but unfortunately never got off the ground. Um, and thanks to Officer Severance, who's here this evening, um, we were able to kind of use her skills through her community policing through environmental design SEPTA um, training that she's done to start incorporating that into the Neighborhood Watch program. And the, one of the things that came out of that was we need more light in the community because light deters crime. It is the cheapest way to deter crime. So what you see going around our two units that we came up with, the black one is a battery powered unit for a home that does not have an existing flood light or porch light on it. The one that's in the uh, plastic wrap screws into an existing light bulb socket. I actually bought those and put them on my house. It turns any regular light into a motion light. They work great. Um, so they're two very inexpensive solutions that will provide light for residential homeowners and even renters in the community if they go through Officer Severance's neighborhood watch program and go through the SEPTEC class. So that way they're investing their time and learning what they can do to help deter crime and help us reduce crime throughout the community, make it safer, more inviting, warmer environment for everybody. Um, so with the $30,000, that'll cover the majority of the homes throughout the community um, and as many people as we can get through it. I hope to come back next year and actually get for more money to expand it. So we've got the program guidelines, the agreement that they'll have to sign is all outlined things to Ms. Thuppen. And um, Officer Severance has graciously agreed to teach as many classes as she needs to. So um, with that, we'll gladly answer any questions that we have. And again, this was approved by the advisory committee 7-0 um, back on August 13th. Very, very good. Thank you. Discussion up here? Ms. Stiles and then Ms. Drossel. Um, this came up at last night's community watch meeting as well. Um, can you say how long the training course is and how often it will be offered? That's something that we can. We will we'll, we'll make it work for them. We're going to offer it immediately before or after Neighborhood Watch. It takes about an hour. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it took for me to learn it all okay. uh, with her teaching it. So she can probably do it for people faster than that. Great. Um, but it's pretty quick. It's, it's a lot of common sense stuff that you don't think about. 
and she does a great job of explaining it. So. Great, thanks. Mr. Uh, only that I, that I fully support this. Uh, that, that is really needed there. Uh, Officer Severance, mm -hmm. Severance started this several years ago. <coughs> the small ring, remember you brought the ring program mm -hmm. up, and I don't know how successful that was, but this will be uh, perhaps even more successful, and I think the key will be to market it to the community to make sure those community homeowners know that it's available through a grant program. It's got to be a win-win for everybody. So it's a great, great idea. Thank you. Any other comments from the table? Anybody in the audience wish to speak? Back to council for um, I move motion. approval. Motion. Second. Second. Um, res, um, roll call. Ms. Haraldson? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Crail? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Ms. Burnett? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mayor Hope? Yes. <coughs> Resolution number 2019-194. Community event and program sponsorship application for the Unite the Block Unity Day. Ms. Stepp. Resolution number 2019-194, <coughs> Northeast CRA, a resolution of the Northeast Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Mildora, Florida, pertaining to the grant sponsorship program for the 2020 Unity Day event, providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for grant approval, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for Scribner's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you. Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Again, uh, Adam Sudner, Northeast CRA, or excuse me, Northeast CRA Coordinator. I always throw the other name first. Um, so, um, again, Adam, will you give a, a, just a summary of the program? The funding is approved in the budget, and the date of this, uh, according to the schedule, is January the 18th, and just confirm that date. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the event is scheduled for January 18th. Um, as you remember, February of 2019, we approved the Community Betterment program in the Northeast CRA for community event sponsorship. Um, we had a couple different ideas of how we thought this would work. Uh, funding these types of events was definitely part of it. We have $70,000 in our budget for this year to sponsor these types of events. Um, Pastor Rowe is here who can speak to the event and answer any questions you have. The one thing on this one is we did not take it to Northeast CRA. Um, because unfortunately Pastor Rowe missed the deadline for that. Um, but because of the date of his event and what it does for the community and knowing the the um, support the Northeast Seattle Advisory Committee has had. I wanted to go ahead and bring it to you tonight because this was the only date I could get it on the agenda um, for you to consider it. Um, but unfortunately, our policy does say it's due 60 days out. Unfortunately, he didn't make that deadline. But I wanted. To, but at the end of the day, the policy gives council, setting as the Northeast Seattle Governing Board, the ability to waive that if you so desire. And, and this was only for three thousand dollars. It is within the budget line item, so um, there's also that waiving of, of ability to to make that choice. And, and I'm sorry, what time is the event? Jane. No, I got the date. The time? Oh, uh, we start marching at ten. Ten. And then we will keep the festivities in the park at eleven. Okay. I was just going to suggest that Pastor Rose should earn his money by coming up and making a statement. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Rose, 1155 uh, North Clayton Street. Um, we started this last year with the uh, partner with Neighborhood Watch. Uh, our, Officer Ivy was big in helping us get this started. And basically, uh, we came up with hashtag Unite the Block. And the premises of it is to unite each block in the Northeast community, one block at a time. And I'll read the mission statement and the purpose for you real quick. Um, Unite the Block will forge much common ground in uniting, empowering, and equipping the residents of the Northeast community with tools to create a progressive community and a safer community for their neighbors and themselves. And our purpose is to Unite the Block is made up of volunteer residents, volunteers and residents that live in and around the Northeast District of the City of Mount Dora, volunteers and residents whom have expressed their concerns for the safety and well-being of other residents and the upkeep of the community. Unite the Block will have a collaborative approach to serving the community and work in tandem with other like mission organizations to deliver services. Services such as Unite the Block, um, Unity Day, Literary Cleanup, Beautification Projects, Reducing Overgrown Vegetation, and abandoned lots, residential properties, yard maintenance, neighborhood watch, and community town hall meetings when necessary. We will implement these programs and services free of charge to residents in the Northeast community. 
Our goal is to change the community from within by urging the residents to become accountable and taking action by doing their part to better the community. So that is what good. we do. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Okay. Any questions? No. Okay. Any discussion here? Anyone in the audience? Okay. I'll entertain a motion. I move we approve, uh, we waive the time period and approve uh, 194, please. Second. Okay. Roll call, please. Mr. Rolfson? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Creel? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Ms. Burnett? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mayor Hope? Yes. Okay. Other business. I know we have the. We have the Northeast Community Christmas Party this Saturday. Yes, ma'am. Um, set up at 8 o'clock for anyone who wants to come help. We start at 9, if I'm, am I correct? The, it starts at 10, from 10, 10. to 12. Okay, I was an hour early. Um, but so set up is 8-ish. 8 o'clock takes a little bit to set up. And 10 o'clock will start, and we'll be over by noon. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody wants to have It's fun. You get to see the kids. The kids get very excited. Anyway, so that is this weekend. Um, anything else? Uh, any other business for the Northeast? We'll be adjourned. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to uh, <laughs> remark to the dates that will be closed at City yes, Hall. Um, so we'll be closed on December 24th and 25th. We will close at 2 o'clock on the 31st, and we're closed on the 1st. So you'll see the so notices posted at City Hall. Um, send your emails, but we also have a lot of folks taking time off. But you'll receive their out of office, and we'll be glad to respond accordingly as soon Sounds as we're good. back from the holidays. I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. Yes. 